in any given moment, we have a choice either to step forward into growth or to step back into safety. Abraham, one slow. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Esperance Luvendau, and I will be your moderator for today's Namibia Infertility Conference 2021. Now, today's the 11th of March, 2021, and I hope you all have your calendars with you because this date will go down in history as one whereby the One Economy Foundation, together with its partners, continues to table pertinent issues related to reproductive health. So today, on the 11th of March, we are choosing to step forward into growth into territories previously considered a taboo and not worthy to be discussed. So to kick us off, ladies and gentlemen, I would firstly like to welcome a woman that is so dear to my heart, a woman that needs little to no introduction at all, gender and child specialist at the One Economy Foundation, Dr. Veronica Tron. Good morning, uh, Dr. Lubandau. Thank you for that introduction and it is my privilege to do the welcoming. I think uh, my role here is simple and it's to give a hearty welcome to each and every participant on this platform. First of all, welcome to all our speakers and moderators. Welcome to our um, people that will do the personal testimonies. I think it takes a lot of courage and braveness to be on this open platform and to tell your story on infertility. Also a hearty welcome to our guest speaker, Mr. Lennart Saika. Thank you so much. Um, we are privileged to have you on this platform, also to share with us uh, a global overview of the issues on infertility. Um, I will also make use of this opportunity just to give uh, participants, the speakers, our panelists, a short overview of where we're coming from and where we are now. So where we're coming from is March, uh, I think 11th of March last year, we had our first Merck More Than a Mother conference where the first lady was then announced as the ambassador of the Merck More Than a Mother campaign. Uh, the very same day on the 11th, we had a health media training also to shed light and to debunk the stigma, the myths um, and the misperceptions on infertility. Uh, the 12th of March, we were privileged to launch a storybook uh, at one of our secondary schools. And that was Polis's story um, with a specific focus to raise greater awareness amongst youngsters, amongst uh, school learners. Um, one of the post-event um, interventions was then to disseminate that storybook to schools throughout the country um, in all 14 of our regions. Um, we also had the 10th of March last year, a meeting with couples and with women with infertility. And we could draw insight from all the challenges they've mentioned in that meeting. And I will also just shed light on that. So some of the problems or challenges shared by uh, what we call the heroines, the very first one that is a big issue is stigma and discrimination. We will hear a lot about that throughout the conference. Then there was also mention made of the pressure from partners, but also in-laws and the, the wider family. Many insensitive questions, sometimes jokes. Um, they made mention of cultural norms and traditional beliefs. And we heard stories that you really can't believe how uh, couples and women with infertility challenges cannot participate in many of the traditional rituals or events just because they cannot conceive, because they cannot have children. Uh, a big pertinent and recurring issue was the high medical cost um, um, and that people cannot afford um, the infertility treatment or any medication because of the high cost. 
some of the ladies mentioned side effects of the medication and how it impacts their day-to-day -day function. And many a times, a lot of absenteeism at work. Um, they also mentioned the emotional effects when, for instance, the treatment is not successful. Um, they mentioned mental and physical effects when there's multiple operations from a very young age, but also um, in young adult life. They then mentioned because of, due to the issue of infertility, how many of them struggle with marital problems, relational problems that might lead to breakups, but also divorces, um, rejection, and all the mental problems that goes with that. Um, and then how some of them lost their jobs because of insensitive um, employers or people that does not have a full understanding or comprehension of what infertility means and the side effects and consequences of the treatment. Um, so those were a few of the, the effects mentioned by the ladies and the couples with infertility. Uh, my next slide is quickly on um, the post, because many uh, of the participants might wonder, after the, the conference March last year, what transpired? What were our interventions? So the first one, um, uh, so having this conference today was a recommendation from the conference we had last year, March. And um, the, some of the post, I will just mention a few of the post um, conference interventions. We immediately started a WhatsApp group. And on that WhatsApp group, we ask permission of all the participants at the conference and in that specific meeting, um, if they are willing uh, to join. And then we send regular uplifting messages and moral support. So we could pick up from different parts of the country, the region, if there was somebody who needs specific psychological support or medical support, whatever the issue was. We established a support group Unfortunately for now, the support group is only catering for participants and people in commas. The idea is if we have big enough interest that we will uh, roll the support group out to the specific regions. We also identified focal persons in the regions for that reason, but also to continue to raise greater awareness and to advocate for uh, uh, people with infertility issues. Um, we received shortly after our radio talks, I, I remember we were on uh, Good Morning Namibia, different platforms. We received a lot of inquiries and what was a pleasant surprise was there was many, many questions and inquiries from male partners. And that for me, is, I think is a step in the right direction because it shows that the platform is safe enough for people to speak about um, the challenges they face. Um, out of the inquiries, quite a few of the couples and individuals received um, counseling and they also re they were referred to appropriate agencies uh, depending on their needs. Five of the beneficiaries, five of our heroines were then linked and Merck Foundation, our biggest partner in infertility, uh, provided financial support for them to, to start their own businesses because the economic dependency was also men mentioned as an issue. And that's why people can sometimes not walk away uh, from toxic relationships and marriages. So we want them to be self-reliant financially. We also had media award handovers, um, different platforms. I already mentioned the awareness uh, creation and advocacy. And I think a last one is that we incorporated infertility topics in all our speaking engagement. So as an office, we don't want to make it issue specific because we know there is a direct link between infertility, sexual and gender-based violence, mental health issues, HIV, all the other social pathologies that we deal with on a daily basis. So we really tried 
to mainstream the message, the key messages of infertility on all our different platforms and during our different speaking engagements. Um, I think uh, I will stop there. Just for you to know what, what you can expect during the conference is uh, Dr. Kimberg, one of our local experts and uh, gynecologist in private practice, um, Dr. Ndovi, also an infertility specialist, they will set the scene. But then we will also put a human face to infertility. When we have two stories, uh, and I am happy that we can also have a male on this platform to share his story with infertility. And I would like to thank them wholeheartedly for being so brave and courageous to be on this platform. Then we are looking forward to our interactive dialogue. Um, and I want to reassure participants that there will be a discussion with the panel members, but it will also be open for participants to participate. So welcome again, and thank you for joining us on this significant um, occasion. And we will try to make it an annual event, and we will also try to make it more um, uh, functional in the rest of our regions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lubanda. Thank you very much for that welcoming. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the opening remarks, Dr. Veronica. Very insightful indeed. I think one of the things that stood out to me definitely was where we were and where we are right now. And somebody once said, they said, you know, we may not be where we want to be, but we are certainly not where we used to be. And that on its own is a reason to be proud of ourselves for the progress that we have made. So I would just like to make a very, very quick announcement to all of our viewers. Please note, this is interactive. So you can post all of your questions. We will try our very best to interact with all of them to answer all your questions and to inform and engage with you as far as possible. Up next, I would like to make welcome a man who has over 23 years of pharmaceutical experience. Now, the theme on its own in fertility is a very, very broad one. We need to understand that. And because it is so broad, it's also important that we all understand that it's not necessary for you to be a medical doctor, a nurse, a health advocate, or a pharmacist for you to be interested in this topic, because due to the fact that it is so broad, it affects every single one of us in one way or another. And so today the aim is to increase our general baseline knowledge on infertility so that whether it affects us or not, we can then be informed and be able to tackle myths and issues surrounding this topic, infertility. So up next, I'd like to make welcome Senior Program Director, as well as African Head of the Merck Foundation, with over 23 years of experience, guest speaker for today to give us a global overview on infertility, none other than Mr. Leonard Saika. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Really appreciate the introduction. And uh, it's a pleasure to be on this panel. It is a wonderful, wonderful uh, event and a very important one. And thank you, Dr. Veronica, for the introduction and the opening remarks. I believe the achievement we made during the first conference in Namibia was a great achievement and a huge step into a brighter future. So with those remarks, I will do a short presentation that I will just highlight our short partnership introduction of what Mark Foundation does, and then we'll go to the nitty gritties, the issues about infertility, a global perspective. We have the experts in the group, Dr. Kimberg, Dr. Lugano, who will go in. To I think I need to be allowed to share my screen. Can I kindly be allowed to share the screen, please, Steve?
Okay, great. Thank you. Excellent. So at Mark Foundation, our vision is to have a world where everyone has a healthy and fulfilling life. Really, we are a philanthropic arm of Mark AGA, and that is our aim, to empower, build capacity in healthcare so that we have a better access of medical uh, services to our population. So under Mark Foundation, we have numerous pro uh, programs that we run. Uh, the key and the pillar for us is the Mark More Than a Mother Foundation. That will be our main topic today. We have the Mark Cancer Access Program that focuses on oncology. We have the Mark Diabetes uh, Blue Points. This is on diabetes. And we also do a lot on uh, the STEM uh, for women and youth sustainability initiative, particularly to encourage our young girls and women to take up the science and the mathematics so that they can take up these new challenging uh, careers in life. So we also have a lot of initiatives that we do annually with uh, our first ladies. We have the Mark Africa Asia Luminary, which is coming up in the 27th to the 29th of April. And we shall invite a lot of people from uh, Namibia to participate. So this is just an overview of some of our products. I want to pass my regards of our CEO. You can see her there, Dr. Rasha Kelej. Uh, she's now a senator because of our recognition by the president of, of uh, Egypt, because of the work that we've been doing as a foundation. So in this meeting today, it is a huge meeting. The step taken by Her Excellency, the First Lady of the Republic of Namibia to be the patron and ambassador of Mark More Than a Mother is a huge step. And the changes that we are going to see in the near future through our commitment here as panelists and participants is very important. As you will see at the end of the discussion today, our role is very crucial to change the mindset about infertility in Namibia, in Africa, and in the world as a whole. So if there's any slide that we need to take home today, it will be this slide. This slide represents the, everything about infertility. We are talking about in Africa, though we don't have concrete data, but we're talking one out of four couples are infertile in Africa and developing countries. In the US, it is one in eight. In India, we are talking about 10 to 15% of the couples are infertile. Infertility is a growing, growing concern. And it can be measured in two ways. One, with the number of couples visiting uh, IVF centers for the assisted reproductive technology uh, treatments. That's number one. Number two, it can be measured by the reduction of the number of children being born in our, in our families. An example, in the 1950s, the United Nations reports that in, uh, we used to have up to five children in a family. Now we are talking about two. So infertility is a huge, huge concern. And then we have the two types of infertility. We have the primary infertility that uh, is immediate. The child, the couple cannot conceive after marriage and having uh, unprotected uh, 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 relationship for over a year. Then there's the second one where they are able to conceive the first child and not able to conceive the second child. So that is called the secondary infertility, which of course, Dr. Kimberg and Dr. Lugano will give us more details on that. Secondly, what is very important here is that around 85% of the infertility cases are due to untreated infectious diseases. Hence, our role of disseminating information and talking, opening the dialogue about infertility being very, very important. We must use all means to disseminate this information, open the discussion in our families, in our communities, so that we are able to discuss it openly. 
because 85%, if we're able to reduce the infections, then we shall be able to reduce the number of patients that will need even the specialized treatment. Secondly, women are solely blamed for infertility. And as a man here speaking today, uh, I want to apologize on behalf of all the women in, in, this, in this world and particularly in Africa for this, because science has proven that also us men contribute significantly to infertility. So we need to take responsibility as men and support our women to go through this infertility together. It's very, very important. Secondly, is about the, the services available, the treatments available, the specialists available. You find that in our countries in Africa, the number of specialists, embryologists and clinics to offer the IVF service is very, very limited. And this is one area where Mark Foundation has come up powerfully to increase the number of these specialists across the continent, across the African countries. And so this is very important for us. This slide for me represents what infertility is, that it's very important for us to, to keep that in mind. That number one, it is an increasing uh, condition that we really need to talk about. So let's keep this in mind as we proceed today's, in our today's discussions. At Mark Foundation, these are the strategies that we put across so that we are able to support our partners in each country to achieve our objectives. Number one was to create a cultural shift. Dr. Veronica has clearly mentioned stigma is everything in infertility. Gender-based violence is there in fact, is caused by infertility. And you, particularly now with, with, with these issues of corona and everything, all these things has been happening. Infertility also, what is important we've talked about raising awareness, educating and training African embryologists, fertility specialists, building advocacy through partnerships, governments, policymakers, healthcare providers, and also, and then empowering infertile women socially, economically, through access to awareness, health, and change of mindset. As Dr. Veronica had mentioned earlier, when you empower a woman, you're empowering a community. And we are very grateful of what the five uh, heroines and heroes that we empower in Namibia have achieved. And we will continue working with them and we will enroll more so that we change the life and then the people that we touch will also touch other people. So it's, it's a ripple effect. So even with our communication, we shall have that proceeding on the known. So we use a lot of community awareness to build uh, awareness in our communities. So we use, we, we visit the communities, we go to visit the presidents, we work with the first ladies, just to build consensus together and help get help on how we can build the platform for communication and also for the training of some of the doctors that are required for each country so that we build the human capital required in all these African countries. This is a summary of some of the doctors that we've trained. Over 180 doctors have been trained either as embryologists or fertility specialist. And we've enrolled during the coronavirus, we came up with, a, with a, an online program on sexual reproductive medicine, because now we could not take some of the doctors into, into our training centers. So we had to, to quickly find a solution so that we also continue with our programs. So we've up to now enrolled 150 specialists in this, and it, you can see it cast across 34 countries. So we are trying our best to reach as much as, as we can in the African continent and beyond. So Dr. Lugano is there. You can see he's one of our alumni doing very well and uh, helping us also create the myth busters in Namibia that was very unique for us because some of these myths that have existed uh, create a block in our mind that 
this is the way it is. We will need to move that boundaries so that we open a discussion for all of us to agree that infertility is a problem. Number two, we need to work together so that we are able to solve and get solutions in the short term and in the long term. Then we also use our heroines to pass the message, to talk about it. And this, as Dr. Lorenka said, today we have some of them with us. It has taken them courage to come out, to talk about their condition. It is not easy. It is not easy. And we really appreciate what they are doing for us and what they are doing for themselves and the community. Because when they talk, then people will listen more than if we just talk from our end. So we really appreciate them and we really value their contribution in fighting, fighting infertility and being spokesmen and women of infertility in their communities. Apart from that, we use our ambassadors in different African countries, that's the first ladies of the republics, to talk about infertility and to share messages across their countries. So this helps in uh, encouraging the young and the elderly also to see that if my first lady is talking about infertility, I think it's an important subject. If she talks about it and tells me we, the government is doing this, she's partnering with these institutions to do this and this, I think that helps and opens up uh, a room for discussion. So we really appreciate what Her Excellency, the first lady of uh, Namibia is doing in empowering his team so that we can have such a meeting. And a continuous uh, meeting like this, as Dr. Veronica says, will be very, very variable. So some of the alumni that we use also, uh, some of them are on this call today, and we really appreciate them. We use them as our ambassadors in their countries so that they talk about the programs that we do, so that we have a network across the continent so that that network communicates the same message that we want to reach out there. So the correct message reaches the communities through our specialists. And when a doctor talks, we all listen. So for sure for us, we know that we have ambassadors, so many of them across the continent because we have empowered our alumni with information and knowledge. And they are changing the landscape of uh, medical speciality across. And we are really proud of them. We can see their message from my excellency, the first lady of uh, Namibia, Mrs. Monica Gengos, that infertility, fertility is a shared responsibility. Very important. So we use such on our social media platform to continuously talk about infertility so that we continue raising awareness. And you can see that alone, we have over 3 million views on some of the uh, platforms that we use. So this is reaching out there. It is the message is there. And remember, we talked about 85% being the cause in, of infertility being infection. And if we can be able to reduce that through information, then we shall be achieving a lot in terms of the fight against infertility in our society. Okay, so this, some of the other first ladies from other countries. We focus also English speaking, French speaking. So we are across the continent. My foundation partners with all the first ladies across the continent to try and pass these messages. You can see there some of the first ladies also. Some of them, and of course our CEO. So as I said, during, during, during the pandemic, we, 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 we also got affected because we were doing so many clinical trainings abroad. We used to take our doctors from their country to other countries for the clinical training. So we needed to respond quickly so that we have and continue building this healthcare capacity. And uh, what was important is that we came up with almost six online courses that we started immediately. So one of them was the sexual and reproductive medicine. And this is crucial because it also has an aspect of infertility in it. 
So this, there is a continuity. And you can see we have only enrolled 150 on that. We have the diabetes management. Very important also, a big cause of infertility, as Dr. Kimberg and Uganda will say, is diabetes. Diabetes contributes so much into infertility. So it was a very key topic. Secondly, we talked about cardiovascular medicine. We have endocrinology. We have respiratory medicine, particularly to combat the issues of, of uh, the pandemic and the acute medicine. So all this was created just within the period when the pandemic came. So our response and also response with the Ministry of Health, together with the Office of the First Lady, even in, uh, in uh, Namibia, was very quick to give us some of those candidates that are already ongoing into the, into the courses. So as I wind up, we also use a lot of uh, uh, storybooks to pass message. So this Make the Right Choice was, is a storybook that we are using for the pandemic, talking about community awareness, what is important about the coronavirus. So this is also we are using to talk about the pandemic and try and reduce uh, the, pre, the, the infections through information. We also use a lot of songs uh, to touch the community about uh, infertility. So these are some of the songs that we've been, been, do, been using. We have, uh, and you can see they're getting a lot of views, very strong messages out there because music, it passed of us. Part of us, we love music and messages, a lot of messages are passed through music. We have also some music for by some president, like president of Liberia, did a very nice song on infertility. The former first lady of Burundi also did a very good song on infertility. You can see this is in their heart. They pick it up and push together so that we can be able to achieve something in the communities and for their countries. We talked about David's story and uh, as uh, Dr. Veronica talked about, we launched this storybook in Namibia, the Paola story, and we are continuing going to, to send more books for the distribution because we are targeting an, our young population so that we start that message of prevention from that young uh, age. So the, the, the book we are continuing to, to distribute throughout the Af continent, through our partners and through the offices of the First Ladies. Also, we have Educating Linda, but for Namibia, we are calling it Educating the Shipanda because also we want to encourage our girls to talk and take these science-based courses so that we have so many doctors. I'm happy that today I'm sitting in a panel with so many doctors from Namibia. That's what we want. We want to have that across the continent. We want to empower these young ladies so that we encourage them so that they focus on these uh, subjects for the, for the future and the, for the future, so that when we look, come back to look for doctors to train, we have a base of where we can do that. I am done, but I have a few take home messages that we need to pick today. We've said infertility is a shared responsibility. Number two, it affect, in Africa, it affects one out of four couples. So it is an increasing incidence. We've said 85% of infertility is caused by infections. So we have a huge room to work on to reduce that infertility in our country, Namibia, and in our continent, Africa. And the last is all of us on this important initiative today, we have a burden on our back. We have a privilege to be on this meeting today. Let's learn so much from it. Let's use this platform to go out there and encourage the openness about this subject. When we get that openness, then we shall be able to communicate what we've learned today. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be on this uh, conference today. I'm sitting in, I will learn so much also today. So let's open ourselves to learning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Leonard Saika, for that. Very, very insightful, I must say. 
while I was listening to you, three particular points that you mentioned just jumped out at me. The very first one was just how I love the word you used. You said, this is huge. And I don't think there is any better way to describe it. This is huge. Infertility is huge. And then another point you mentioned, you said one in every four couples struggle with this. And this just means that it's much closer to home than we had ever thought before. And then also last point that you mentioned, you said more than 85 or 85 and above a percent of causes are infectious, meaning that these are things that we can deal with. These are things that we can prevent. The only limitation there is education, education, education. And this is the very, very beginning platforms like this that educate the community and further Thank you very much for all of that insight. And I'd also just like to take note that while you were speaking, I noticed a couple of people joined in all the way from Omsati, people joined in from Kavango East, and then very important, people also are joining us from Uganda. That is very, very impressive because that means that we are carrying the message all across, not just Namibia, but all across Africa. And that is the aim, to educate and to educate and to educate. And so up next, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to make welcome for the overview on infertility in Namibia, somebody that I've looked for looked up to for many, many years. He's probably not aware of this, but even as a student years ago, I always looked up to him. I was introduced to him by a good friend. And ever since then, I've been absolutely wowed by his work, his intelligence, his insight, as well as his experience. Now, this man has over 20 years experience as a specialist gynecologist. And one of the things we always say within the health within the health facility is that you cannot buy experience. And experience comes with so much knowledge, especially when it comes to topics like infertility. So ladies and gentlemen, up next, I'd like to make welcome none other than specialist gynecologist, Dr. Matty Kimberg. Is it on now? Yeah. Or can I? So you must tell me when I must start. Yeah, you can. You may you start, can. Doctor. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the foundation and for the Honorable First Lady and everybody involved in this wonderful presentation and to my wife, Dr. Pietro Kimber, clinical social worker, who helped me put this presentation together. Uh, infertility, why is it important and at what stage do we start investigating it? Um, let's say between 20 and 30 years uh, with, of the patient with regular intercourse for 12 months needs to be investigated. Between 30, 40 years, regular intercourse for six months probably also needs investigation. And over 40 years, she needs investigation anyway. And as Mr. Psycho has mentioned, the male factor is a very important part of the equation. And in at least one third of cases, the male factor should be investigated, unfortunately, is often neglected or overlooked, or the man refuses to be investigated. And it's very convenient to blame it on the, on the woman. And the important thing, if anybody remembers anything about this talk, is that prevention is better than cure. And this is in most cases because in up to 40% and perhaps even higher, there is a preventable or an avoidable factor. Now something, and I'll put it right at the top of the list, is age. Why is age important? Nature has been very cruel. And in fact, civilization has outstripped evolution. At a point where the woman 
is most healthy, most fertile, is often the time when she shouldn't fall pregnant. And so as gynecologists, we find ourselves dealing with two ends of the spectrum. First of all, the naive schoolgirl, the early adolescent or the adolescent, the peer pressure, who wants to, you know, to be accepted, finds herself extremely naive and finds herself pregnant. At the other extreme, the career pressure, the pressure to establish oneself in the work environment, woman put off having a baby. And then they come and sit in front of you over, over the table. They're 39 years old. They look 10 years younger. They've established in their careers. Now they've met Mr. Wright, and now they want to have a baby, and it's not happening. And why? You can't Botox the ovaries. The ovaries are aging. The eggs are aging and getting less. A woman is born with just so many ova in her ovaries. And this is where our problem comes in. Now, to get back to the adolescent, your early irresponsible sexual intercourse leads very often to sexually transmitted diseases which leads to unwanted pregnancies, the problem of backstreet abortions that we find ourselves facing all the time. And this has an impact on fertility in later life. The failure to have regular medical checkups and including pap smears can also be a factor. Can sexually transmitted diseases other pathologies are not picked up at regular checkups. Poor sex education at schools. It's amazing how, how poorly sex is taught in schools. And a poor understanding and availability of contraception. Now, 17-year-old schoolgirl that I saw was 12 weeks pregnant. And I said to her, now, why, if you're going to be sexually active, why didn't you use a condom? She said, doctor, you don't eat a sweet and leave the wrapping, the paper still on. That's the naivety that we, one has to deal with. The poor knowledge of bodily functions and responsibilities is a big factor. Now, I'm going to present you with some cases. Names and places have, for obvious reasons, been changed. But the facts are drawn from my experience for 50 years of treating women. For various problems, infertility has also been a very, something very close to my heart. Let's call her Gladys. She's 35 years old. We would say in medical terms, P0, G0. She's a school teacher. P0, G0 means she's had two pregnancies, but she's got no live children. She's been trying for six months. She's 35 years old. History is that she's had two miscarriages. One of them was a backstreet abortion, which ended up with a DNC or a curatage, and there was an associated infection. She was sexually active at 16 years. She was treated for sexually transmitted diseases. I can give you a whole lot, long list of bacterial infections, chlamydia amongst others. And also a very important and probably your most common sexually transmitted disease is your human papillomavirus, your human wart virus. Does it cause infertility as such? It can cause or lead to cancer of the cervix, cancer of the vulva and vagina, and in a man, 
can lead to cancer of the cervix. And it is preventable by having the human papilloma virus vaccination at 11 or 12 years old. I've got, gone into this. What does it cost? It costs about 450 Rand. Most medical aids will pay for it. And it can prevent a lot of problems later in, in life. Okay, on examining Gladys, uterus was fixed and tender. The pap smear showed atypical cells. She ended up with a colposcopy and a cone biopsy. There were atypical cells, which is a precursor to cancer of the cervix. So a part of the cervix was removed. The after, of this, after effects of this is that it can cause an incompetent cervix, which can affect the pregnancy later on. It can also cause stenosis of the cervix, which can make it difficult to fall pregnant. So what was the next step? It was decided because of a previous history of infection and DMC, it was decided to do a hysteroscopy, which is putting a very fine camera into the uterus. And if this showed adhesions between the anterior and posterior walls of the uterus, which were then freed through the hysteroscope. She then had a laparoscopy as well, which showed adhesions in the pelvis. Dye was injected through her tubes, which showed her tubes were blocked. These tubes were opened through the laparoscope. And she was given the option either go for IVF or try for six months on the fertility pill timed intercourse. She opted to try for six months. Husband had been tested. He was okay. And nothing happened. She, so she was then sent for, to a fertility clinic for IVF, which she involved stimulating the ovaries, ovum retrieval. The ovum were then fertilized with her husband's sperm. A single embryo was then transferred to, into her uterus. There was hormonal support. The remaining embryos were frozen, not discarded. So the moral of the story is if it doesn't work on the attempt, a second attempt with thawed embryos is often more successful than with a fresh embryo. And if she wants a second baby after two or three years, another embryo can be unfrozen and, and used for a second pregnancy. Our next patient we will call Jennifer, 25 year old, paranoid G naught. In other words, she'd never been pregnant, a nursing sister, had been trying for 13 months. Husband was also tested, was normal. She had a first menstruation at 13 years, became sexually active at 16 years. And the history is that ever since her period started, she's had painful periods. And ever since she became sexually active, intercourse has been extremely painful. The examination, general and gynae, and the pap smear were all normal. The blood tests showed that she's ovulating regularly. But the hysterosalpingogram, which is injecting a radiopaque dye through the tubes, showed that her tubes were blocked. So she also had a hysteroscopy, which is examining the inside of the uterus. That was normal. But the laparoscopy showed a condition known as endometriosis. Now, this is not uncommon. And they've shown that probably about 15% of women have endometriosis. 
This means that tissue that normally lines the inside of the womb occurs outside the womb. And it responds to your lining of the womb exactly like the lining of the womb. So every month when she has her menstruation, she has a little mini menstruation in these little pockets of endometriosis. And this causes tissue irritation. Things get stuck down. If it involves the tubes and the ovaries, these can get stuck down. Tubes can get blocked. And the treatment in her case was through a laparoscope, the endometriosis was cauterized, adhesions were freed, the tubes were opened through instruments through the laparoscope called a salpingostomy. And she was then put on the fertility pill, the clomid and the pregnal with timed ovulation for six months with the option, if it didn't work, she would go for IVF. But she fell pregnant with the clomid and the pregnal after three months. Salome, very tragic case, 34 years old, P1G1 means one pregnancy, baby was born prematurely as an emergency cesarean section, the sales lady, issued, and then the trouble started. With the cesarean section, she started to bleed. Couldn't control the bleeding, and she ended up with what we call a cesarean hysterectomy. So she had the cesarean section and a hysterectomy as well. Now, she was investigated. The husband's sperm count was normal. Patient's ovaries were still normal. So now what are her options? Can she still have a baby without a uterus? Now, she was one of the lucky ones. Her sister agreed to act as a surrogate for her. So with the climate and the ovum, her ova were, were picked up, fertilized with her husband's sperm. Embryo was transferred to the sister's womb. And with hormonal support, the sister carried the pregnancy through successfully. Surrogacy is a problem in Namibia. There are no laws governing surrogacy. The only way she can claim this baby is to legally adopt this baby. There's no way she can claim that this is her, her rightful baby. This is something that needs to be looked at from a legal point of view. The next patient is Andrea, we'll call her Andrea, the 20 years old, 28 years old. She's a P0, G0, otherwise, in other words, she's never been pregnant. It's a clinical, she's a social worker. Her period started when she was 17 years old and her periods have always been irregular. The hormones were tested, the hormones were normal perhaps slightly raised ovarian hormones. The prolactin, which is a pituitary hormone, was also tested. That was normal. Sonar showed enlarged ovaries with multiple cysts and follicles. So she was diagnosed as polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCO as we call it. Now, this the other problem now, the husband was tested. Husband was a smoker. He drank more than he should. He was overweight. Had the metabolic syndrome. Now he has type 2 diabetes. His sperm was tested. And his sperm showed a very low sperm count. Now, what is a normal sperm count? Normal sperm count, anything from 35 to 200 million sperms per milliliter, which sounds like a lot of sperm. And it says anything below that is, indicates a low sperm count. 
The other things that are tested in the sperm is motility, the movement of the sperm, are these sperms active and moving around, and also the morphology, are these, do these sperms look more normal, are there sperms with double heads, are there sperms without tails, and the treatment can be, there's, needs to be treated Husband basically needs to see a urologist to check and see if there are any other factors contributing to his low sperm count. Andrea had a hysterosalpingogram again, which showed this open fallopian tubes. That's the dye through the tubes. Now, if she's not interested in falling pregnant at this stage, the irregular periods can be controlled with a contraceptive pill and a drug called metformin, which is also used in type 2 diabetes or used in diabetes. And if you wanted to fall pregnant, the fertility pill, the clomid, as well as the metformin. The other option is surgery. In polycystic ovaries, the ovaries are surrounded by a thick avascular capsule, which prevents the eggs from being released. Now, clomiphene can cause the eggs to be released, but another option, but as unfortunately has fallen into something, some of the disuse because of the availability of IVF is ovarian drilling or wedge resection, where through a laparoscope, little holes are drilled with cautery through this thick capsule of the ovary. I've had good success, or I had good success with ovarian drilling and wedge resection. But in her case, she opted for IVF using the husband's sperm initially, or if that didn't work, a donor sperm. The menstruation was normal after the wedge resection and she fell pregnant with donor sperm after three months. The next case I want to present is Angeline. Angeline, 40 years old, so she's obviously at the tail end of her fertility story. P not G not, never been pregnant. She's simply a casual worker. Her husband left her because she couldn't have children. History of heavy periods, painful periods. Now found Mr. Wright again in a new relationship with a husband who wanted a baby of his own. Now finances come into it. She was not in a position to financially afford IVF. On examination, the uterus was the size of a 28-week pregnancy. And sonar showed multiple fibroids. And the hysterosalpingogram, the dye through the tubes, showed one patent fallopian tube. So she had a myomectomy and a tuberplasty at the state hospital. She was a state patient. She couldn't afford private treatment. A 104 fibroids, fibroids are benign growths that occur in the uterus. 104 fibroids were removed. I've still got a picture of it somewhere, somewhere in, my, in my records. I don't know if it's a world record, but 104 fibroids was a lot of fibroids. She then opted to try for clomiphene and pregnal and timed sexual intercourse. It was explained to her that at 40 years, her chances of falling pregnant were with this scarred uterus and her age were pretty slim and the options were surrogacy or adoption. But she said if she could find the finances 
to get somebody or buy a donor egg, she would like to try that. She then disappeared up north again, and we haven't didn't hear from her since. So I don't know if she managed eventually to have a baby. The next patient is Veronica, and this is just very short, 33 years old, P3G33 pregnancies. Three live babies. She was a businesswoman. And with the last pregnancy, she had a caesarean section and a tubal ligation or sterilization at her request. Unfortunately, her husband died in a motor accident. And when I saw her, she'd formed a new relationship. And the new husband wanted a baby. She was given the option either of going for IVF or going for what we call a sterilization reversal. After due consideration, she decided to try a sterilization reversal, which was the which we did. The two ends of the tubes, of the cut tubes, were brought together. The excised source uh, section had been removed. Uh, these ends were brought together over a stent which was then removed after four weeks and she was put on the fertility pill and she was very lucky she fell pregnant and carried the pregnancy and just to summarize the whole treatment diagnosis and treatment of infertility can be approached and two levels. Firstly, the general or the gynecological level. And as you see in the case presentations, the history and the examination are of vital importance. The semen analysis, very, very, very important. When you think they've worked out that of the semen ejaculated into the vagina, probably only about 1% reaches the fallopian tube where the eggs with the ova are waiting. So the sperm count, the motility, the morphology are very important. Tests for ovulation, one can check for that with ovarian hormones with pituitary hormones like prolactin. A sonar is important and can be done at a general or an ordinary gynecological level. Are there fibroids? Are there ovarian tumors or cysts? Is there a congenital abnormality of the, of the, of the uterus, double uterus, as we sometimes see? And then hysteroscopy and laparoscopy can be done by a competent, interested gyne gynecologist and fibroids, polyps in the uterus can be removed through the hysteroscope, through the laparoscope, endometriosis can be treated, obviously. Even fibroids can be treated through the laparoscope or by uterine artery embolization, which is a new technique where through a catheter, through the uterine artery, very small particles or emboli are injected into the blood supply of the fibroids, which causes them to shrink. Time sexual intercourse is important. The husband may be a long distance truck driver who only comes home once every six weeks. And intrauterine insemination is a very easy technique. The laboratory will prepare the wash and concentrate the sperm with your fertility pill. Ovulation can be timed and intrauterine insemination can be quite successful. Now, where does the infertility clinic come in? Cost factor is a very, very important factor. Not everybody can afford it. The medical aids do not afford infertility treatment. Some of these 
of tests. For example, the hysterocell pingogram, the hydroscopy, laparoscopy, could probably be paid through the, through the medical aid. The IVF, harvesting the eggs, fertilizing them in, in the laboratory with the husband or a donor sperm is, is, a, is very, can easily be done at the infertility clinic. And to go one step further is a procedure we call ICSI, intracytoplasmic sperm injection, where under a very fine microscope using instruments finer than human hairs, one single lucky sperm is injected into the cytoplasm of the egg. So one, one sperm out of how many million? What did we say? That up to 200 million per mole? You can understand why each of us are different. Why each of us con should consider ourselves as lucky individuals. We were the one sperm and the one ovum that is you and me. The infertility clinics they have a sperm bank and an ovum bank where you can, if the patient is not producing sperm or the husband is azoospermic, he hasn't got sperm, it can be used and then implanted into the into the into the uterus and then also they deal with the question of surrogacy in the maybe the child care and protection act prohibits advertising so surrogacy remains a difficult <laughs> problem in namibia thank you very much and that ends my presentation thank you thank you very much dr marty kimberg for that i know i speak for not only the organizers, but every single participant taking part in today's conference that you are indeed a wealth of wisdom, a well of wisdom, pardon me. And it is such an honor to have you join us. I definitely learned much. so much and we, we, we definitely thank you for, for that. I know that we will definitely be engaging you a little bit later on as well, because I noted that we have quite a few questions from the participants that will require some specialist attention. So we will definitely be engaging you just a little while later. Now, I would just like to give a very, very quick shout out to a few people that are engaging with us in this absolutely phenomenal conference. Firstly, Issa Mahanu Nantana, all the way on Facebook, sees such an informative presentation. Rosalinda Green says very informative. I agree with you on that one. And then Sorry Boss Soria says watching from Dr. Malunga's practice. I love this so much. Thanks for this program. And then we have Florence Chisuku who says men are sensitive. Firstly, start with counseling and educating men on what and how infertility works. And then I also noted that we have somebody watching all the way from Onesi family practice that is in Omusati region. We thank you, we appreciate you for joining us in today's informative session. Now up next, we've come to a very interesting, I would call it, probably also very sensitive part of our program. It is time for our testimonies as Dr. Veronica had mentioned earlier on. We're going to be having three testimonies today and these testimonies come from experiences. These testimonies come from people that have gone through this in one way or another and they are going to be sharing their personal testimonies with us today. So up first, I would like to make welcome none other than Florence Chisuku to give us a little bit of an insight of how she almost lost everything. Um, hi, good morning. Can you see me? Can you put this on? I think I'm on right. Can you see me right? Okay, 
Um, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Dr. Esperanza, for, for the introduction. Thank you very much for the um, Foundation for inviting me to be one of uh, the speakers to share my story of uh, overcoming a stigma of living with endometriosis and infertility in um, how I um, hit rock bottom, how I lost everything, my self-worth, my identity, and how, how I had to learn to pick up the pieces one by one to rebuild my life over again. So this is my story. Um, my story starts from childhood. Um, I remember that I always had issues with my menstruation while growing up. And as we all know, in the black culture, uh, certain things are taboo. We don't talk about things like that with uh, our parents, whereby you tell them that you're struggling with your, your menstruation or uh, you have severe pain. So I always had this issue where when I had my menstruation, I had severe pain. I bled uh, uh, like nobody's business. But because it was perceived that it's period, that is how it's supposed to be, I, I lived with, with it in silence, whereby I just told myself that, okay, this is something that I need to deal with once I finish school and once I maybe get a good job one day and get a good medical aid. And I think that was actually one of my motivating factors uh, at school, to finish school in order to get a good job so that I can get a medical aid and then I can approach a doctor who can assist me in my medical condition. I didn't know it was a medical condition at that time, but I just knew that there was definitely something wrong with me because my periods uh, were just too painful and I was just bleeding too heavily. And um, fast forwarding, I did eventually did complete my secondary school. I did get a good job. Uh, at that time, I was working for the South African Bureau of Standards and I did get a good medical aid. And I, the first thing I did was to get a gynecologist at that time in order to approach a gynecologist and then inform him of my problems that I was experiencing and then maybe see if I can rid myself of this issue that I was struggling with. And I remember um, the first gynecologist I saw at that time was uh, Dr. Offert at the Catholic hospital. I'll never forget him. And uh, immediately when um, I had an appointment with him, uh, he did a laparoscopy on me and uh, he did find something at that time and that was some abnormalities. So after that, he put me on treatment and he said that, okay, he's gonna put me on treatment and see and he's gonna do further investigations to see what might be causing the problem of my heavy periods and my um, uh, pain when I have when I'm on my periods. However, in the process while on treatment, I felt pregnant and uh, I had options to terminate or carry the baby to full term. But he told me that, look, at this stage with your complications, uh, having the child would be a good thing because you might have difficulties getting a child in the future. So we can postpone your treatment and then afterwards, after you give birth, then we can look at options of seeing how we can continue with your treatment. So I opted to carry the baby. I gave birth. And uh, afterwards, then um, I went back to him. But my issue of my period became worse, whereby now this time it started affecting me because I was working. I had a child. And it, it, it was just a very uh, a weird experience that I, I, can't, I can't actually explain. So um, I actually started sorting help from different doctors because it became so tiring. It became so exhausting because I go from one doctor to the other, but they would do tests on me, but they couldn't conclude or tell me exactly what was wrong with me. I just knew that they would say that it, it had something to do with my hormones. And by that time, I had so many surgeries done on me because every time I would see a specialist, I would have to go through a surgery. Every time I would see a specialist, I would go through a surgery. So luckily in 2009, um, I had some cysts or stuff that they found in my ovaries. And I think that was my actually my breakthrough coming to the endometriosis. 
So when I was referred to a, a, a gynecologist, um, he actually saw that I had a cyst on my ovary. And he told me that, look, we're going to perform a surgery on you. We're going to remove the, um, the cyst. And then we're going to put you on treatment. And then we're going to take the cyst to the lab to see if it's not cancerous and also to see what might be causing this problem. However, when I woke up from my surgery, my, the doctor who did the surgery told me that, uh, unfortunately, we have bad news. Uh, due to the extent of the cyst damaging your ovary and your fallopian tube on the left side, we had to remove it. And that was also the time that I was diagnosed with endometriosis. And he told me that possibility of getting children in the future is now. And he also diagnosed me with infertility. At that time, I was still young. Um, yeah, it hit me like, okay, so meaning I was able to get children again. But my consolation was, okay, at least I have a child. There are people who do not have children. So at least I experienced the joy of motherhood. I experienced the joy of getting pregnant and stuff like that. So for me, it wasn't such a big deal. However, when I then, you know, started meeting my partner, then the, the reality kicked in of the stigma of a woman getting married, you cannot get children. People are asking, when are you getting children? So as much as I knew that I was diagnosed with infertility, I still had that thing of me being in denial that I can still get children. So me and my partner started uh, going to doctors. We started uh, seeking help. We went to fertility specialists. He got tested to see if maybe he was not infertile. He went through all that process. I went through the process of being put on fertility treatment. It did not work. And then I, uh, 2010, I started working at a local university. And I think that is where my life started falling apart. So already I was struggling with my endometriosis. I was struggling with my infertility. And then I walked into this new job, which I felt as a, as a young woman, it is something, it's an achievement. But because of the extent of my medical condition, whereby I had to continuously be booked off or I had to be sick, it did not sit well with my boss. So as much as I tried to explain to her what the condition was, she just could not understand what type of illness is this that has to do with menstruation. Every woman gets menstruation. What makes my menstruation so special? It's so special that I need to be sick. What makes it so special? So in that time, I also had to undergo a surgery to remove cysts. And I remember one of the doctors who was treating me at that time was Dr. Timber. And uh, the victimization and the bullying at work became so expensive that I did not just struggle with the we're just sorting out very 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 quick technical glitch thank you very much though florence we are i think from my side personally i have I don't think I've actually heard it from such a personal side and aspect and experience before. So it's definitely fantastic hearing from you. And I, I speak for, I, I believe a lot of the participants also to say that this is very courageous and we appreciate you. All right, so we'll take it. Um, doctor, uh, I'm not sure. I was muted there. I'm not sure if I. Yes, I think there was just a little bit of a technical glitch. Enemy oh, of progress, okay, okay. we call them, but you may progress. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, all right, yeah. So um, uh, I suffered a nervous breakdown because of uh, my employee not understanding my medical condition. And uh, it became so severe that I did not just struggle with endometriosis anymore, I struggled with other illnesses. And uh, I, 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 I was going through so much bullying and victimization at work. At the same time, I was trying to keep my work. I, I was trying to fight for my work because 
it, 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 it became so public at my workplace that uh, Florence is always sick. She's paying doctors to book her off. She's paying doctors to operate on her. And it, it, it affected me mentally. And uh, I, I, I went into a complete mental breakdown. And uh, I was diagnosed with uh, two nervous breakdowns. I ended up at Okongwari three times. I was taking four types of antidepressants. I was in a bad space. And uh, one day my doctor told me that Florence, every time I get a call around two, three o'clock in the morning, I know it's you. Do you really want to lose your life just because of a job? You are young, you are talented, you are educated, you're qualified. Why don't you just walk away from this? And then you find yourself again. Mm-hmm. At that time, I didn't want to because I felt that I've worked hard for this. I've, I was fighting to get a transfer. When that failed, one day I just said, you know what, Flo, this is it. Enough is enough. Go to UNAM, hand in your resignation, walk away from this. I don't know where I'm going. I don't even know what's my backup plan. The only thing I knew was that I had to get out of there. I handed in my resignation in 24 hours. I took my son. I told my parents I resigned. My parents were not happy about it. I moved to Walfish Bay because that is where my husband was staying. When I came here, I was broken. I was lost. I was confused. I was a mess. I was broke. I had no direction. I was angry. I was bitter. I was resentful. I was like, all my life, I I, I worked so hard on me. I hated the condition I had. I hated everything. I was just um, a, 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 a bitter, resentful person. And then I decided one day, I, I just said, you know, I need to work on myself. I met a lady. And the lady said, Florence, why don't you seek a Christian counselor? You have, you have too much anger issues. And I said, I think it's time that I need to start working on myself. And at that time, I was unemployed. I was in Wildfish Bay. And then I decided to get myself a Christian counselor, a psychologist, a life coach to help me fix my life. And in that time, when I was going through this uh, emotional counseling, spiritual counseling, I had to face a lot of truth. And that is to start by educating myself on my medical condition. Because I only took what I was told. I didn't understand what endometriosis was. I didn't know that I had other options by living with endometriosis, like living a healthy lifestyle, changing my diet, changing my environment. I was just looking at it from a point of anger and from a point of confusion. So I decided to start fixing my life. And in that moment, I also decided that as while I'm looking for a job, let me go in the community and start volunteering my time. I started vol- volunteering at the prison. I started working with women at the prison. I just doing Bible studies with them. In that time, I started finding myself. I started finding my healing. I started, you know, uh, uh, having purpose again, finding joy in, in, in things again in my life. And I had a very supportive husband. You know, he, he used to tell me that, you know, you've got so much. Go out in the community. You, 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 you have a very good listening skill. You know, there's a lot of people out there who can, you know, make use of your listening skill. Listen to people. You always give people good advice. Do that. And in the same time, start looking for a job instead of sitting at home and becoming depressed. Oh my gosh, I never knew that me going into the community and me volunteering my time, that was God steering me into a different direction. The minute I started doing that, I started seeing God opening up doors of opportunities for me. I started advocating for women's rights. I started educating women who are suffering with chronic illnesses by helping them cope with these diseases. I started talking to women who were struggling with infertility. I started sharing my story. The one minute I was this lost, broken young woman who didn't have any direction, the next minute I'm this woman just volunteering in the community and doing all these things. And in that time when I really started finding my healing and you know, getting off the antidepressants and finding myself, me and my husband had a discussion and I said, okay, I heard that if you remove your womb from, uh, if you have endometriosis and you remove your womb, then you can get healed. 
So me and him had a decision. We made a decision and we decided to go to the doctor on a specific day to tell the doctor to make an appointment for me so that I remove my womb. Because what is the use of me having my womb? The day I went to the doctor, the doctor said, okay, Florence, before I remove your, I give you the letter to go to the gynecologist, let me do a pregnancy test. And I said, but doctor, you know, I, I, I can't get pregnant. I mean, you know the story. The doctor did a pregnancy test and guess what? It came out positive. My husband was shocked. I was shocked. I was in denial. I said, I didn't, I, I don't know what happened. He said, let's do a blood test. It came out positive. It wasn't an easy pregnancy. I bled my whole nine months. I had continuous, mis uh, uh, continuous threatening miscarriages, but I had exceptional doctors that really supported me in this difficult time. I was put on strict bed rest. And in 2014, I gave birth to a healthy baby boy. And I started finding myself again. And I started realizing when I started letting go, when I started healing, when I became, when I started fo focusing on my emotional part, when I allowed my body to heal, something in me happened, something in me changed. At that time, I also started, you know, building my relationship with God. I started doing things on a different level and I got more involved in the community and I, I founded an NGO called Healing Wound that focuses on offering psychosocial support and counseling because I realized that there were a lot of people like me walking around with brokenness, with deep rooted issues. And it doesn't matter how good job you have, how much money you earn. If you have not dealt with issues, with trauma in your life, it can be blockages. It can lead you not to see things from a different perspective. And as the Lord really advanced me on this platforms where I started engaging on regional level, where I started, uh, influencing young women. I started mentoring young girls. I started mentoring women. In 2018, I had a skin problem where I had severe acne and the doctor put me on Accutane. And one day I felt sick. I had a blackout. I landed in hospital. And when the doctor did a test, I was pregnant again. After being diagnosed with infertility, I felt pregnant again the second time. And after the pregnancy, my doctor said, Florence, you need to terminate the pregnancy because you are on Accutane. Medically, I understood where the doctor came from because of the Accutane, because he said, if you wanted to get pregnant, we had to take you off Accutane for six months, but you were on Accutane while you're pregnant. And the risks which are involved with you carrying this baby to full term are very high. Your baby can be born without arms. Your baby can be born without legs. It can be complications with you. I prayed about it and I told the doctor, you know what I'm going through? And he said, okay, it's fine, no problem. But I think when I was in my fourth month of pregnancy, I only realized, yo, I made a mistake. I called my doctor, I said, doctor, I don't think I can carry this baby to full term. Can I terminate? And, he, and she said it was too late. And I was faced again with another huge, difficult pregnancy this time, whereby I suffered so much. I was in hospital, but my, my gynecologist was such an exceptional woman. Every time I used to see her, because I used to see her once a week, she would tell me, Florence, you made it this far. If you made it this week, you can make it the next week. Just keep on so that the baby grows, the baby lungs develop. And I carried the baby up to eight months, but I had complications. The baby had to be removed. Um, I had to give birth through cesarean, but my baby was born without her lungs developing and she ended up in ICU. And I felt so lost and I thought, wow, I knew this was gonna happen. But by the grace of God, my baby was in ICU for three weeks and I saw how she fought for her life. She pulled through and today I have a bouncy, healthy, three-year-old baby girl with no medical conditions, no medical problems whatsoever. And uh, I just became this, this woman that I never thought I would become. And today I can, I can say that, yo, 
I struggled with infertility. I struggled with a lot. I lost everything. I had hit rock bottom. I was lost. I was confused. I was just a mess. But I decided to pick my life up again. You know, I, I decided to allow the power of forgiveness. And I, I didn't look at my boss as this monster and this horrible person anymore. I looked at her as the person who God used to push me out of my comfort zone. Because had she not treated me that way, I would have never knew that I can become the woman that I am today. Today, I'm, I'm a motivational speaker. I'm a qualified life coach. I'm a Christian counselor. I'm a director of an NGO. I, I empower and mentor over 1,500 young girls in Erongo. I have a, a women's ministry where I mentor over 200 women. I am an ordained minister. I have a, a wonderful family, an awesome husband that understands if I'm not feeling well, that they are not feeling well. That understands if I'm bleeding for three weeks, it's because of the medical condition that I have. I have awesome mother and mother-in-law. If I'm not well, they take over the responsibility to help me take care of my kids. I have awesome community that looks up to me, that supports me. Today, I want just to tell those women out there that infertility is real. And it's a stigma that sticks to women. I've been there. Even while I was diagnosed with infertility, I was in denial. But for some reason, there was this fighting spirit in me. I never knew what God was doing in my life. I don't understand why God allowed me to go through all those surgeries and infertility and all that. And then at the end of the day, allowed me to conceive and give birth to two beautiful miracle babies. But all I can say is each and everyone has their own story. Some might not be able to conceive naturally like I did. Some maybe might adapt. Some might maybe uh, use a uh, fertility treatment. But all I can say is that the best way to start with infertility is to educate yourself yeah. and look for help. And I am very passionate about counseling. Counseling helped me to heal from pain and brokenness. It is not a stigma. It is not witchcraft. It is not taboo to suffer depression. I've been there. I was, I was like, my mind was not there. I was taking antidepressants for years. I was admitted in Okongwari. Okongwari is a psycho mental health facility. It's just a beautiful name because it's private. I've been there. I was in a place where I didn't even know myself. But because I decided to fight back and to pick my life up again, God made me to become this exceptional woman. And today, I just want to thank the Milk Foundation to give me this opportunity to share my story and hope that I can touch someone out there who has given up hope and who is struggling and who has lost herself that, you know, beyond the pain, beyond brokenness, beyond suffering, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> I had to stop myself there a little bit. I found myself getting a little bit emotional. I had goosebumps all over while I was listening to you. And I don't want to say too much, but I want to commend you for your strength. You are a strong woman. And once again, I know I don't only speak for myself and the organizers. I speak for the participants. I speak for all the thousands of people that are going to watch this that you are courageous and we commend you for that. I have a few people that also commented and said, Florence, I admire your courage. Another said, as a person struggling with infertility, I am so moved by Florence's story. Thank you for your courage. And another says, Florence, so sorry that you went through all of that. We thank God that today you are able to talk about your story so courageously. And just before you go, Florence, it reminds me of a poem that I read earlier that I really feel this is the right moment to share with you by Nina J. Luke, a little excerpt from the poem. And it says, all of the hurdles that you have jumped, the mountains you have climbed, the trails, the pain, all of the lessons that you have learned and the experience that you have gained make you more than qualified to help someone going through the same. There is power in your testimony when people know you can relate. 
So thank you very much for that. Up next, without wasting any further time, I'd like to make welcome another testimony to the front to share her story very briefly. I'd like to make welcome Martha Emanuel. While we wait for the technicalities to be sorted, I'd also just like to make mention to commend the Merck Foundation for the amazing work that they are doing. We heard a little bit more about it during the introduction, as well as the global overview and the Namibian overview of infertility as well. They're doing absolutely fantastic. And I especially commend you for all the doctors that you've trained. I myself am very much interested in this field and who knows, I might just consider taking part in one of your sponsorships anytime soon. So I definitely do commend you for taking this very, very, very broad, broad weight on your shoulders. All right, so without wasting any further time, I'd like to make welcome to the front while we wait for all those, those technical, technical issues to be sorted. I'd like to make welcome. This is a little bit of a different testimony because this is from a male perspective. And this is very important because as we mentioned in the beginning, fertility and the issues surrounding infertility are not a woman's responsibility solely. But this falls equally on the man and the woman. And so I trust that we have with us Mr. Salote Vinasius. I trust that he is ready and ready to go. And so we will give him an opportunity to share his perspective from the male perspective. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Salote. Hello. Good morning, Mr. Salute. Are you with us? Good morning, everyone. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perhaps you can increase your volume just a little bit. I myself speak very loudly, so I love it when people speak just as loud. There we go. I can see you and I can Thank hear you. Thank you very much. Yes. Right. My name is Vanessa Salota. First of all, I want to thank God for everything he has done in my life. And each new day that he gave to us, I realize that it's a Gift, and that gift is for us. With that gift is the hope of our goodnesses, faithfulnesses, and provision. I will be forever thankful. Secondly, I want to say thank you very much to our Med Foundation for giving me this opportunity to say something about male infertility. I always feel And 
and the outward reaction may come to table mode of expression. Male infertility is any health issue in a man that lower the chance of his female partner getting pregnant. About 13 out of 100 cannot be get pregnant with unprotected sex. There are many causes for infertility in men and women in over a third of infertility cases. The problem is with the men. Yes, there's always hope in infertile men to have a child by having a treatment condition and after treatment couples can become pregnant naturally in some cases your doctor will command you that you and your partner seek assistance with productive treatment used to achieve pregnant such as in vitro fertilization Infertility can also be caused by illnesses, injury, or chronic disease. This diagnosis will cause you to see yourself as improper men. Often develop a sense of failure and feel they will miss out an important life experience. Here are some emotional effects. Feeling of inadequate, lose control, thought of failure, guilt, physical reaction, and relationship fall out. Apart from all these factors, there are professional and support groups such as our MEC Foundation, which really help us to copy with this life by giving us hope for funding us to stand up for our self. I was jobless and I was struggling with my life to put a bread on the table. When Mac Foundation ever in my life, <coughs> all has changed. I'm now able to keep myself busy in the garden. And when I harvest my product, I will sell to my customers and get something for myself and my family. Thank you, MEP Foundation, for your support and for giving me another life. I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Salotti, for that very powerful testimony. I am um, I'm absolutely mind blown just at listening to you at the very fact of how the Merck Foundation really came in to just help you to change your life for the better. And also just having you speak from a male pers perspective is phenomenal because once again, as we mentioned before, we need to continuously reiterate the importance of men in our day-to-day -day lives getting involved. And I know a lot of young men that are watching today are motivated and inspired by you to take charge of their situations. So up next, without further ado, we would like to be are kindly at probably the segment that you have all been waiting for very eagerly. It is now time for the interactive dialogue. And to take us through this particular segment is none other than Ms. Ruche Locke. And just very briefly, she is a seasoned media personality with a rich track record. And what stood out to me the most was she has over 20 years experience. That experience is unmatched. And if you are in the media space, you know that there is a lot of skill that comes with years of experience. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Ms. Rishi Rock. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor, for that beautiful introduction. Indeed, a great privilege for me to be part of this insightful conversation um, of a very, very sensitive, but also very important topic today. Um, I am cognizant that we are slightly behind time and therefore I'm gonna jump right into it, um, perhaps just 
um, a word of advice to our participants. Uh, we have allocated a separate slot um, for questions and answers. However, due to time constraints, we would like to encourage you to continue um, posting those questions in the chat box as you have been doing, and um, we will gladly attend to some of your questions. Allow me to introduce you to our rich um, panel this afternoon. I'm going to start with Dr. Lugano Ndovi, um, who is a member of the Merck Foundation alumni and also a qualified fertility specialist through the Merck Fertility Training Program. Very, very excited to have you on board, Dr. Ndovi. Thanks for joining us. Then we'd like to welcome Dr. Susan Malunga. Uh, Dr. Susan Malunga is a phytotherapist with a passion for transforming people's lives. While she runs a wellness clinic, she's also a motivational speaker and she has expertise and firsthand experience in dealing with infertility in a rural setting. Good morning to you, Dr. Malunga, and thank you so much for joining us. Our next you, panelist Rishay. is Ms. Helena Mutsing, and she possesses over 10 years of corporate experience. She says she's got a knack for making meaningful connections with her audience and an insatiable appetite for helping people maximize their potential. Additionally, she is an advocate for infertility and works tirelessly to raise awareness on the issues of infertility and the stigma surrounding it. Ms. Elena Mutsing, good morning and welcome. And then last but not least, Mr. Denver Kisting, an award-winning Namibian journalist, a seasoned moderator of difficult conversations and MC of note. And I'm sure you can relate to this face. In 2020, um, Mr. Kisting scooped an international prize from the Merck Foundation for his daily COVID-19 update show on NBC. Good morning, Deva, or rather good afternoon and welcome once again. And, and I just want to clear Denver, I think everybody um, on everybody's uh, lips and minds are the fact that you have actually gotten rid of your long traces. So I'm sure people are trying to connect the face um, with what we are used to, but welcome. All right, I think let's uh, right, uh, jump right into that. And I'm going to start um, our dialogue this morning by giving each of our panelists a chance um, just to share with us their experience in their expertise, um, uh, uh, in their field of expertise. And I'm gonna start with Dr. Ndovi, who is a fertility specialist um, in the Kavango East region. Now, what came out very clearly, doctor, um, as we've heard from our previous speakers, including um, our guest speaker who gave an, in, an a global overview on infertility. Um, we've also just heard from um, uh, Ms. Florence Shikusu's uh, testimony there, as well as Dr. Matty Kimberg, that there is still a lot of stigma and discrimination um, when it comes to the subject of infertility. And whether this is um, partners and in-laws um, or family members, as we've heard it earlier, we've also heard from the testimony there that discrimination also happens in the workplace, discrimination and victimization. Now, it also came out clear that fertility or infertility for that matter is not just a female issue, nor is it um, a male issue, but it's really a couple's issue. The question that I have on my mind is, and having listened to everybody's contributions thus far, how does one cope with the emotional ups and downs um, of, of this uh, particular subject, Dr. Ndovi? I'm not sure if Dr. Ndovi's mic is unmuted. Okay, I think in the interest of time, let me um, move over and then we'll come back to Dr. Ndovi. 
Let me move to Dr. Malunga, uh, who is a health practitioner and phytotherapist um, representing the Kunene region, and that's also where you practice. Um, Dr. You've got a wealth of expertise and firsthand experience um, in dealing with infertility, specifically in the rural areas. In that regard, is, is infertility still a real and or major issue, um, in, specifically in rural areas? And what would you say of people's understanding of infertility? Um, thank you, Rishé. Good morning, participants. Um, Rishé, you, I would like us just to take it the concept that infertility is not really understood, um, especially in the rural area, especially coming from a very traditional background. And in people's minds, when you talk about assisted ART, assisted reproductive therapy, um, being IVF, in people's minds, the misconception uh, the misunderstanding is that babies born from assisted um, fertility is, are not real babies. So already that mindset, you have to, uh, have to deal with that mindset. Um, when you tell uh, male traditionists that, um, sorry, sir, but I think you are, a bit, you are infertile, you really have that and it's like, uh, doctor, no, me, a male being infertile, what is that? So it comes with the understanding, first of all, of teaching and putting the right mind frame when it comes to dealing with issues of infertility, because before you deal with the whole treatment plan and management, you first have to deal with the whole mindset. And that is where the challenges comes from. So I first have to create the right mindset for my patients or my client in order to um, have them understand where the whole issue of infertility comes from. Now, in the rural areas, um, Roche, we know that um, I deal a lot with where there's not so much of the education going on. So there's the challenge is here of really bringing the whole education um, engaging the, 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 the community on first of what infertility is, what are the causes of infertility, and how we go about treating the infertility issues. Mm -hmm. Now, um, infertility, as we know, is generally perceived as a woman's issue, uh, and for which women are often uh, uh, blamed for. Um, how involved are men um, and I hear what you're saying, and it's a very important point that you made around education. And it's something that also came out of the testimony of Florence, that we need to educate ourselves. That aside, how involved are men when it comes to the issue? And how do they respond and react um, to consultations where they are uh, to be found as the infertile partner, for example? Um, I must say, Roche, I have, especially in the rural areas where I am, I have great respect and I'm really humbled by the women here because they will never publicly uh, publicize or bring it out that the male um, is infertile, even ha us having discovered that. They will still take the blame for it. Um, that's how much respect they have for that. And um, normally the men would never come um, with the women. It's only after the woman has gone through tremendous um, treatments and we're finding now proof that it's not the woman, that it's only the time that the men will come in. But even if they come in, there's still that stigma, especially having to deal with the woman. Now, you know how the male um, ego and all that. So having to admit to a woman that he is infertile, that already is a struggle for them. But I have such a good understanding and I have to lay the ground for them that it's not about don't look at it as a, den, gen, a, den, a gender issue but let's look at it as a way of how we can actually contribute and help you to solve that problem but I must say really um, most of the clients that I deal with and once I say I can educate them and I let them know you know they still even though you're infertile even though you have low sperm count this is what we can do let's find a treatment they are really receptive towards it and they really um, go through the whole treatment um, until the end. And there really have been good results. So uh, for me personally, it's really laying the foundation, bringing the patient to the right set of mind that will really allow him to, 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 to be able to deal with the issues of infertility. But on the negative side, you do get still those patients, the male that 
would not uh, accompany the woman. The woman has to go through it alone. And I have a lot of clients that still tell, you know what, you are the woman, just go get the tablets for me or the medication for me and I'll take it from there. So it's still a challenge having to get the men to come with the woman um, to have a consultation. Most of them at times prefer to come alone, um, uh, do the treatment alone. And also most of them are not prepared to have the conversation around infertility because the Rache, the one thing which I find really um, a challenge is that infertility is seen as such a, a secrecy, has such a bad thing. So people have that fear. When you say, when a man has to admit that he's infertile, there's really that fear. And that fear comes from obviously the community um, stigma, the family stigma. So they don't actually come out because of the whole stigma around it. It's not to say that they don't want to admit, but it's the fear. It's the male pride of saying, they're having to admit, you know what, I can't bear kids. And that's why I said, regardless of that, the women still stand by them. They don't abandon them. They don't go um, seek other treatments. They accept it. If the husband is infertile, they accept it. And that really is the humbling part of, of the whole uh, uh, nature and the work of my, of my work. So it really is a lot of challenges. But as we said, slowly and slowly, we're getting there. So who are these men, in term, men and women, in terms of age and demographics, et cetera? What are we looking at? Um, you're looking at males, um, mostly around already in their 40s, most of them sometimes in their 30s, 35 up to 40, 60, uh, because where I am, seated in the Kunene region, there is this... Um, believe that irregardless of what age a woman is, she's still supposed to bear children. So even if a woman is 50 years old, she still has to bear children. That's just the understanding there. And in terms of men still, you know, even though he's 50 also and 60, he still wants to uh, bear children. So because of they feel the richdom of the importance of where they attach in having a family, in having kids. So that's how they perceive it because they see children as an inheritance. They see children as a pride. So irregardless of what age it is, they would want to just have a, a child or bear a child. Um, we've heard earlier from uh, Mr. Saika that one in four couples are infertile in Africa um, and developing countries. When we look, take uh, your region as an example, um, what are some of the main reasons for infertility in both men and women um, that you've identified? Um, most of them has to do with um, the reproductive system, um, menstrual cycle. Most of the issues that I deal with is the menstrual cycle, irregular menstrual cycle. Um, a lot of some of them have endometriosis, um, the pecos. Um, so those are mostly uh, one of the issues. And most of them also, it's the um, immune compromised. Uh, patients. And when I mean by immune compromised patients is patients with HIV AIDS. Um, mostly those are the ones that really also struggle with infertility and also those are mostly also the clientele and patients that actually come in to seek infertil uh, for fertility treatments. Mm -hmm. Finally, just before I move on to our other panelists, um, as phytotherapists um, promoting herbal and, and natural remedies, do you have any success stories that you can share with us, doctor? Yes, definitely, Rache. So how I do my consultations is that once we have identified, I obviously refer the patients first to specialists to, to confirm and to diagnose that there is an infertility coming back. Um, so once that area is, is, is established and they already also go in treatment, then we come, as like Flo said, the mental health of the patient, the dietary and nutrition, that is what I really um, um, strive on. So once we have that, if your mental health is right, if your dietary is right, if your nutrition is right, if you eat healthy, if you exercise, if your stress levels are okay, if you really are in touch, then the whole issue of the infertility of the conceiving can now take place. So I really had success stories. I mean, just even last week, I had a woman that wasn't able to conceive, but once we really put her on this treatment with the whole dietary, the whole nutrition, the whole mental health aspect, she's actually, she actually called me and says, oh, thank you, I'm actually pregnant. So they are really success stories. And I think at the end of the day, that was actually humbling us at the end of the day. That's great to hear. Thank you for sharing some uh, wonderful insight and um, uh, experience 
there with with us. Um, Miss Elena Mutsing is a fertility advocate. Uh, very pleased to have you with us. Um, let's just start by explaining to our participants um, what exactly does that mean. So, very very good question. Hello to everybody. Thank you for everybody who's tuning in. Very, very good question, uh, Roche. What that really means is it underscores what we're doing here today. Everybody in the different spheres that we're sitting in some way or another is trying to address this issue of infertility. I think as Dr. Esperanza was saying earlier when you were introducing the pharmacists that it's such a huge issue that it has inlet points for different people to play different roles to kind of make sure that we move the needle forward when it comes to the conversation of infertility. I've chosen to be an advocate for infertility because it's something that's all too familiar to me. It's all too familiar to me and many people that I know. I can identify with the story that Flo shared earlier today. I can identify with the story that the gentleman shared earlier today on, on infertility because at some point, in my life, in my family, in my friend circle, we've had these kind of, of, of issues pop up. And I think for me, it's personally just a decision where I've opted to use my voice to talk about the challenges that are there, to normalize that conversation, number one. Number two, also to create the right kind of awareness when it comes to the options, the treatments, the diagnosis, and all these other things that go along with, with um, infertility, just by way of helping people understand what the challenges are to live with infertility, but also that there is um, solutions out there that we just need to apply ourselves differently to and make use of to sort of live our lives without having to live our lives under a shadow or an umbrella or a banner of, of infertility as if that was some sort of a life sentence. So that's really what being an infertility advocate is for me. Well, we've heard from, from our previous speakers and, and um, testimonies that uh, infertility is definitely not only a medical problem, but it's also social and um, it includes social and economic problems as well. Um, why should one advocate uh, for fertility and what's the impact um, of advocacy? Yeah, very, very good question again, um, Roche. If we look at the conversation that we've had this morning, um, Dr. Kimberg, for example, shed some light on particularly the issues around surrogacy, the legal issues around surrogacy, surrogacy being an option of, of conception, but also now the legal issues that surround that, that needs to be uh, the, the conversations that need to be had and, and, and legislation that needs to be amended to be able to accommodate that. So you've got legal issues, you've got education issues, you've got belief issues, culture issues, you've got, you've got so many aspects of this that um, conversations need to be had and work needs to be done to change the climate so that it can become a more um, conducive climate for people who struggle with infertility to conceive. I think for me personally, there was a point where I needed to make a distinction between was I trying to, what was my biggest issue? Was my biggest issue trying to fall pregnant or was my biggest issue trying to be a parent? And those are two different things for me because trying to fall pregnant, the treatment regimes that go with that are different from me saying, okay, well, I'm, I'm not sure if I wanna go through all of that, but I do wanna have a child and I do wanna have a child that is related to me, ideally, if that's possible. And so um, there, are, there are the alternatives also that you need to bring up for people to be aware of, adoption being one of them. I'm a, I'm a mother of an adopted daughter, and I think that was probably the best decision for me by far. Had I just taken that option a lot earlier in my life, it would have saved me a lot of trauma, it would have saved me a lot of challenges, it would have saved me a lot of issues that I didn't really understand at the time. So there's a lot of issues, like I'm saying, there's the legal issues. For example, in some countries or in some jurisdictions, you have um, tax breaks for people who have adoption, who have adopted, for example. So if, if, if you 
ease the burden for the state in this way, the state eases the burden for you in that way, that kind of thing. But also, like I said earlier, the surrogacy issues. Um, Dr. Kimber did highlight one case in particular where your sister could carry your child, for example, your egg, your husband's sperm, your sister carries the child, who has the right over the child, those kind of things. Um, support programs. Um, I'm happy that Florence, for example, is one of, the, one of the members on our support group because we've got a WhatsApp group that is a support group that Dr. Veronica mentioned earlier, uh, earlier in her conversation. But establishing support groups in the different localities where we are, where people can just come and talk. Because sometimes it's just through these conversations that we also begin to understand that A, you're not alone, B, there are things that you can do to overcome or to make life better. And then beliefs, oh my God, beliefs, culture, religion, the boxes in which it is placed when you when you start articulating things around infertility. Oh, she hasn't got enough faith. She's not Christian enough. Oh, she's just, you know, all these, these things that come out of that because people either over-spiritualize issues as opposed to dealing with the medical issues at hand, or when it comes to cultural things, people being included or excluded out of conversations or meetings or segments or sessions by virtue of, of, of the issues of infertility. And then of course, the last one for me, which is a really, really important one, the financial impact of infertility. Uh, no person who has gone through that journey would tell you that it's, it's not an expensive journey. It's a very, very cost-effective journey. And how do, we, how do we begin conversations that help our medical insurances understand that you know, these are conditions that ought to be covered. How do we also have conversations that clarify what role the state can play for patients that are not covered under medical insurances? So it's like a whole conundrum of, of, of issues that need to be discussed around that. And I'm really happy that uh, the Merck Foundation with the First Lady's Office under the One Foundation are championing this conversation because it is a really important conversation and it's a conversation that needs to be prioritized because it's got so many different aspects that we need to look at. I'd like to take this comment from um, one of our participants, Otili uh, Vafinjovo, uh, who says that breaking silence and stigma against infertility involves community education and sensitizing it. Some of us are sometimes involved in counseling, even though not so detailed and formal. And then she asks the question, is one allowed to use copy of any topic presented here as a reference, Otili, um, we will make sure that our coordinator addresses that uh, particular part of your, or that question um, in your comment. Now, I'm linking that comment to what I want to ask you because I, I believe there's a, there's a close connection. And that is, um, I mean, you're doing an excellent job in terms of being that advocate. Uh, how does one like Otili, because I'm reading in between the lines that she's definitely an advocate as well. How does one become an advocate for change in your community but not only in our community, in our country as well, because we've heard this is larger than just a community. It's, a, it's, it's an issue that we as a country need to own. What would your advice be, Helena? Um, Roche, I really want to link my response to International Women's Day that we celebrated on Monday and with the theme of challenging things. I really think we need to challenge norms. It's it, it does take courage, to be honest, to come out and say you're infertile because it's such a taboo type of issue, but that's really the first place to start. Whether you are infertile or you know people that are infertile, normalize the conversation. Stop dilly-dallying around the conversation and making up excuses for why people aren't having children and, you know, because you, you force people to come up with reasons that are unreal and you live in this bubble and in this state pursuing something that is unreal. So let's just normalize the conversation, first of all. Take the trouble to find out about infertility. You need to find out enough so that you are able to tell people. And I mean, going to the community space is one, one thing, going to the national space, going to the global space is another thing. But just in your family, for example, we all have young girls in our family. And we've heard through the conversations today that oftentimes those conversations start too late. Oftentimes the investigation and the diagnosis start too late because we don't talk about these things too freely and too openly. The impact that uh, infections can have, for example, just non-sexual related infections can, for example, have. And in this instance, I'm speaking specifically about the girl child. 
but we need to normalize the conversation and we need to start talking about the inlets for infertility, the diagnosis of infertility, and the treatments for infertility. And you've got to inform yourself to be able to inform others. Start small groups um, in your family without shying away from things. Talk to, talk, talk, to, talk to people about it. Talk to people in your neighborhood about it. Talk to people in your platforms about it. Um, that, in my view, is one way of snowballing that, that conversation. But then you can also have other structured approaches. You can set up support groups, whether they are virtual, whether they are face-to-face -face type of uh, groups, where you know we can come together and we can talk about the different issues that we're having. In our support group, for example, which is a virtual one because everybody sits in such different parts of the country, we I've learned quite a lot from, from, from the people on that platform. I've learned a lot from people who had different stages of their treatment plans. I've learned a lot about treatments plans. I've learned a lot about how some couples deal with the challenges and why, how other couples um, deal better with the challenges. So if you start those kind of conversations and you start intentionally start those kind of platforms, you begin to normalize the conversation for yourself and those around you. And after a while, it becomes sort of difficult to believe that Infertility is an uncomfortable conversation for some people because it has become such a normal part of your conversation. Right. Well, Ruben Kanime agrees with you. He says, definitely my thoughts too. Ms. Wood saying the question of state fertility clinics is long overdue, taking into consideration the financial burden that comes with infertility treatment. Thank you for sharing with us. We'll come back to you. Um, I believe that we have uh, on the line now, Dr. Ndovi, uh, welcome back, uh, fertility specialist from the Kavango East region. Thanks, um, thanks so much once again. I think um, one what was what was interesting for me earlier was um, when I listened to uh, to Dr. Kimberg um, when he spoke about the right age. I guess there's not there's probably not a particular age or the right age, but the ideal age um, is uh, you know in your much younger years to to, to get pregnant. Now, the, now we sit with a with a dilemma because obviously we. Um, I am a mother of, of, if I take myself as an example, of a youth, and um, I would like him to first prosper in his career. Exactly the stuff that Dr. Kimber was referring to. The question now is: so when do we start? What is the right time to consider, um, you know, other options for for starting a family? What would you say, Dr. Ndovi? Thank you so much uh, for uh, allowing me to be part of this wonderful uh, team and sorry that I've missed quite a lot uh, due to the internet connection. Um, but to answer your question, um, I think the starting point would be what are the issues that have already been dealt with? Because there are certain options that can be done and I'm looking at what can we do in a resource poor setting before we start jumping, because here I think I don't want to push the narrative that infertility is all about IVF and so on. I think uh, Dr. Kimbeg, when he was presenting, he was telling us in some of the cases where women are, or the couple is allowed to go and try at home um, options, and then you go back. So I think in terms of picking up where to go on, should be what are the things that we can do and I'm looking at our setup in, in the rural areas that we are, we can't provide IVF. And obviously it's a conversation that we'll always have that we want to have IVF, but probably it will not happen. And people are getting older, as you're saying, at what age then? So probably the first thing would be to look at, at the initial stage, what sort of um, interventions can we give? We talk about counseling the couple to know the timing of the sexual intercourse, we want to provide medication on top of that after you've been investigated. So for example, if they do find that probably there is an ovulatory problem, then you'll be given medication to try that at home. But again, I saw in one of the questions, how long can one take those medications? Remember, it has to be um, a discussion between the clinician and the couple because time is very crucial. You are 35 and we're still pushing for you to drink chromid for months and months when we know that probably a better option would be uh, for you to have um, 
IVF, for example. So those discussions should be based on individual patients, discussing those with, uh, with, with your clinician, which unfortunately, again, it's a resource that we don't have everywhere. That, you know, we've got clinicians that can decide for you to say, listen, you've tried this, let's move on to this. And unfortunately for some of us, we're continuing to give the same treatment because most of our patients want something to be done. They can't afford uh, IVF, for example. So you see that probably you put a patient on, on Chromid for, for months and months and nothing is happening, but that's the only thing that they'll have. If we have all the available resources, all the available options, probably it would be much easier to say, listen, we've tried this, we need to move on to this other stage. Dr. Ndovi, you're touching on, on um, a topic that's, that's coming very pertinently in our, in our chat box, and that is the issue around um, affordability, how cost-effective is treatment. If I take, for example, Ndafa um, Paco's question, um, no, I'm sorry, this is an anonymous attendee who's asking, what is the price range of IUI and where can one start? Um, if one wants to consider it? And secondly, what's the price range of IVF procedure? Um, how many days or weeks does that procedure take? Perhaps you can just um, in a, uh, very briefly address um, those two questions for us. Um, the way I know the uh, price range probably for IUI would include one buying the IUI. There's a special, the one that we are using at the moment, you have a special package uh, of an IUI set that you have to buy, which include a syringe and, um, and um, uh, a cannula that we have to use. Mm -hmm. That will cost you about three um, 3,000. Um, and usually that has to be paid cash. And then you have to include uh, medication that you have to buy for you know, uh, ovulation um, induction. And then we have to include, therefore, um, semen preparation. If we're not going to use uh, the, the 3,000 pack that I was telling you about, then um, in terms of laboratory um, settings, you're talking about semen preparation and so on, which in most of the cases, as, as far as I know, would cost probably uh, close to 3,000 again, uh, just for a semen preparation to be done. And then depending on which institution you go to, the clinician will then definitely add on their, uh, their price. So we're not talking, we're talking about, for the last time that I calculated, you're talking about 17,000 just for a simple IUI procedure to be done. If you're talking about um, the actual IVF, and again, IVF will probably include other things like ICSI and so on. Um, the biggest cost that I've seen is to do with the medication that one has to take before the procedure. But roughly from some of the quotations that I've seen for most of the patients, it will not probably be less than 80 thousand Namibian dollars and that will be probably one cycle and then probably the following cycle it will definitely be much cheaper because like we um, I think Dr. Kimbeck mentioned earlier on um, most of these you can you know you, your success rate will actually increase if you are using um, a frozen embryos so in the subsequent cycle uh, the, the price range goes a little bit less but those will be the ranges. So you're talking about 17,000 probably up to almost um, 18,000. Mm -hmm. Another question from um, our participants, uh, two more questions. And uh, Dr. Ndovi, as a member of the um, Merck Foundation alumni, I believe you can um, address this. Uh, Ndal Fampako wants to know, has Merck trained state doctors for fertility? is an expensive procedure and not all the Namibians who are struggling with infertility are able to afford it. Um, this would need state doctors who are specialists that can also assist them. That's one part, um, one question. And then we've got Yapo Jlaim Aboa who asks, what is the organization doing to support masters and PhD students in Namibia who are involved in, in infertility or fertility research for the country? 
So in terms of, um, yeah, in terms of uh, MIF Foundation training um, um, specialists in the state hospitals, the, the program, as far as I know, the IVF program that um, MIF Foundation was providing at the moment had to be put on hold because of the pandemic. Now, the alternative is where um, state doctors, and I know that a few started last year and some who have actually joined the training program um, this year, this month actually in March, um, are part of those that are being trained in towards um, achieving um, certification to become a fertility specialist. So the initial IVF program up until probably the, the pandemic is over because the training is done outside um, Namibia. I know mostly uh, you, you travel to, to India for training. So that has been put on hold. But as far as I know, most of the candidates that have been enrolled on the online training um, last year and this year most of them are from the from the state hospitals. And this is just to try and increase the number of specialists that can manage most of these uh, infertility cases in the in the rural uh, areas. In terms of, um, I think uh, the issue of the masters um, and research, uh, that probably I would want to ask Leonard to, to probably uh, guide us on that one. I wouldn't be able to give a a definite answer on that. I think I'm going to allow, allow Mr. Saika to come in and um, hopefully address that question for us. Mr. Saika. Thank you very much. I think, uh, uh, Dr. Ndovi, you've clearly answered the part of the, the training. We had to stop the clinical training because of the pandemic, and we quickly moved on to the online training. And uh, we are proceeding very well. Already some doctors from Namibia are on board. We are recruiting more for September batch. So that number will continue to increase. And immediately things normalize, we shall go back to the, uh, to the clinical trainings. That gives us a better hands-on uh, uh, capacity and, and uh, empowerment to our doctors. So this is just for the time being, but we are waiting for things to normalize and then we shall pick it up. In terms of the research, the very good question, this we can be able to look into it. And if possible, I would like uh, the gentleman, the doctor, uh, the lady who uh, asked this to reach out to me, uh, please, we need to follow up on this. We need research in different countries to understand more what can be done. And this we can easily look together with our CEO, what we can be able to support to achieve the research in infertility in Namibia. This can be a done. Thank you so much. Dr. Ndovi, um, uh, one last question from my side. Uh, when we look at um, fertility treatments, what are some of the medical complications associated with, especially with invasive fertility treatments? So I think then we need to look at um, the, the stages that one has to go through. Um, so the complications that one would probably get would be first of all for someone else who is undergoing investigations. I think we heard in the beginning that uh, part of the investigations may require one to have a hysteroscopy or a paroscopy. Those are surgical procedures. So complications related to surgical procedures, uh, you know, infections, you know, injuries to other organs and all that, that could be part of it. And then you're looking at now when you've been investigated, you've been put on treatment. The medications themselves do have you know, side effects and that can cause um, uh, complications. And the major one probably that you'll be hearing about is um, um, ovarian hyperstimulation from the medications uh, that we, we, we use. So we've overstimulated the ovaries and then you get uh, a lot of other um, cascade of things happening, you know, fluid um, accumulation and, and so on and so forth. And then you move to the actual procedure uh, where you have to harvest now the eggs. Um, during that as well, this is the minor procedure. 
but it also colors its own complications. So mainly injury to the bladder. Um, and one who is doing it has to be technically good to know where exactly you want to uh, do the aspiration. And then you move forward, therefore, after that, most of the times you would want to continue with them um, uh, with uh, with uh, with uh, with the treatment um, to to prevent things like you know we call it endometrial support so to try and and prevent miscarriages and so on. However, I always feel that the biggest challenge throughout the whole process is a psychological part of it that probably is a major complication throughout the whole treatment process, where one has to go through all these injections every day before they go for you know. Um, for, for them to, to, to get the, uh, the harvesting of the eggs. And then just imagine after going through all that process and something fails, because it's not 100% guarantee that you're gonna get pregnant. So I think the biggest complication out of it through is the whole psychological process that one goes through. Um, injections, you know, you go through the, the surgical procedure and the failure of the pregnancy. How do we deal with those issues? Mm -hmm. So in other words, am I right in um, saying that it's not just about the treatment and the surgical procedure, but that a great um, deal about that is counseling as well? Sure. And I think in most of the set, set centers where you go for, especially for IVF, they emphasize a lot on the counseling part before you start the treatment, because the journey is too long. And there's so many things that definitely are going to happen throughout. And so one really needs to be prepared. And they always would have, you know, counseling, counselors available online, or you can call them, you know, to get, you know, support when you're going through the treatment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just a, a final question quickly uh, from Mesa Haukena who asks, does family planning medications contribute to infertility, um, especially to women? I've had this uh, question several times. Um, first of all, I just want to emphasize the fact that family planning methods are there if one is planning for the family. So you want to, let's say, reduce the number of pregnancies that you want or space the number of pregnancies that you you want to use. And we do know that some of those uh, family planning methods would have some side effects. So some of them probably, you, you find that probably you're not getting your periods. So obviously if you stop using, for example, if you're using an injection and you stop using it and you don't get your period after that, it would delay your fertility plans. However, you would always want to therefore restart the cycle of you know getting your period so you get medication and so on so from that angle as well yes you would lose out it will affect your fertility and again it also depends on how long you've been using those medications but i've always said that you know one before we say that it is all to do with the uh, family planning method we need to know if something in between had to happen, because we talk about secondary infertility. If you were pregnant before, you um, started mm -hmm. using um, a, a contraceptive, and unfortunately, probably you've uh, contracted an STI, and that ends up damaging the tubes. It's not necessarily the, the, the family planning that is the problem, but something else has happened. So I always say that, yes, family planning may contribute to reducing your chances mm -hmm. of falling pregnant, but always some of these are reversible, um, these are reversible uh, conditions that, you know, later on you can still conceive. However, while one is using family planning, they should be mindful, especially in our setup where um, the biggest and the common cause of infertility is infection, that that can come in whether you're using family planning or not. And usually mm -hmm. you need to play it safe mm -hmm. because that will be the only key thing. Thank you, Dr. Ndovi. Denver, as a media practitioner, um, what would you say, Denver, are your immediate observations um, of how infertility is portrayed um, in the media? I.e., would you say there's a bias um, towards women? Um, is it a women's issue? Uh, yes, please share with us what your observations are. 
Good afternoon, Roche. Good afternoon, fellow panelists, and good afternoon to all the participants. First things mm -hmm. first, Roche, I'd like to confirm that this is indeed mm -hmm. Dean Bikisting, although with a lot less hair. <laughs> I also want to say that this is indeed a very commendable platform. It's an indication that we are on the right track. We're having the right conversations. And there's no doubt that the intersectionality of the approach is what will ultimately make a big difference. As far as my observations are concerned, I have to concede from the onset as well and make an admission as a journalist that we're certainly not doing enough. We're not doing enough to give a voice to people who are affected by this either directly or indirectly, and a lot more needs to be done. A simple Google search would reflect that a lot of this, the, the findings that pop up relate to help that's available and um, advertising and marketing material around that. And as far as stories are concerned, and as far as journalism is concerned, we see very few accounts. And I think what we also need to accept responsibility for and it's part of the lessons and the takeaways that for me for today is that we must stop telling stories on behalf of other people. I think we must allow people to tell their own stories. We must create safe spaces where raw dialogue can happen. And today is a fantastic start. And it's something that journalists can use optimally, whether it's in print or in broadcast or online, to make use of the platform at your disposal and provide a voice to those who can help address the stigma, who can help address discrimination and help us talk about these very uncomfortable and awkward topics to ensure that uh, people seek help on time because it is, as Dr. Kimberg shared with us earlier, in 40% of the instances, if I can remember correctly, help is possible. And also if help of some sort might not be available at that particular juncture or avenue, that there are other avenues to explore that it's only the end of the world, that's the end of the world. And um, so we shouldn't lose hope so easily. Enver, so what would you say are some of um, the key challenges uh, when reporting on a sensitive subject like infertility? Um, what, what are some of those key challenges in the media fraternity especially? I think in the first instance, we have to admit that journalists as media practitioners, we're also human beings. That brings about certain realities. So as a human being, you have certain biases. You subscribe to certain stereotypes. You might directly or indirectly support some level and some form of discrimination. So if you acknowledge that, it's, it's the ultimate point of departure. And being aware and cognizant of what your own shortcomings are, what your own challenges are, and perhaps those of the platform of the institution that you're associated with, you can try and implement specific tools and create intentional platforms to make sure that you create these avenues for these stories to be told not on behalf of these people, but by these people. And I think um, engaging people on a platform like the online space or television on radio um, to have people from different schools of thought, perhaps also people with very traditional views, with very conservative views to allow those people a voice as well, because we can only change their mindset if we also hold space for them, if the safe space also includes them. So we must own up to um, the discomfort, we must own up to the uncomfortable and awkward conversation. And I think we also need to hold each other accountable as media practitioners, as human beings, as Namibians, and call people out uh, during the Sunday lunch when they ask insensitive questions to that family or that couple in the family who don't have kids yet. We need to know that it's in the first instance, none of our business unless these human beings want to share the story. And secondly, we have no idea what people are going through at a particular time during a particular moment. And therefore we shouldn't assume that we think what is going on. Um, ironically or otherwise, we, after our preparatory uh, trial engagement on Tuesday, uh, I had to pay my barber uh, an important visit. And in this space, I overheard a conversation that demonstrates how fact is often stranger than fiction. So um, one of the ladies had asked another lady whether or not she was pregnant. And after the lady said that she was not pregnant, the one lady insisted that you must be pregnant. In the end, what unfolded was an incredible tragedy where the lady shared she did have a baby not too long ago, but that baby passed away in her absence. Then again, this lady wanted to, do, to know why were you not present? And she shared, and unfortunately, many of us heard this, that she was burying her mom in the north and had left the baby in the care with her sister-in-law at the time 
and the baby died, unfortunately, due to unexplained circumstances. So that just demonstrates how insensitive we can be. We have no idea what people are going through at a particular moment and that we all can be a lot more mindful and hold space for one another, create safe spaces. Mm -hmm. Denver, finally, the media plays um, such an important role in and can play such an important role in removing the stigma that still it attaches itself to infertility. How can they go about, how can the media go about dealing with the matter with, as you've just uh, shared that uh, very sad story with us, um, dealing with the matter with more sensitivity, more compassion, but also leaving a message of hope. Thank you, Rishi. Earlier this week, during her remarkable address on International Women's Day, the First Lady spoke about you know, toxic masculinity, patriarchy, um, misogyny. And the newsroom is no stranger to those realities. Toxic masculinity also happens in the newsroom, is also a phenomenon that's present there. Um, so is discrimination on various levels. So I think it's important to, to clean a house from the inside. Before, before we look outward. So then there's a lot that journalists, that media practitioners, that media houses um, need to accept responsibility for to make sure that their own biases are firstly addressed internally, that to make sure that they, the lens through which you portray a story, the, the, the story that you assign to a journalist, uh, that, that your bias as the news editor, your bias as the editor, your bias as the manager of the newsroom doesn't affect um, the ultimate story that's told. It's only through awareness that we can be conscious about our own biases that we ultimately make a difference. And we must allow people, as I said earlier, um, to share their own stories through their lived realities and lived experiences and through first accounts. And there are various means uh, that, that, that those would be possible by just being innovative and by being creative, by making sure that it starts with a one-on-one -on -one conversation with your colleague while you're making some tea. It also starts with a conversation that you have with your readers, with your viewers, with your audience. Because a lot of the time we see this discrimination happen in the online space. And we're too scared, we're too uncomfortable to hold one another accountable, to hold our audiences accountable, because we're scared we might lose that audience. But it's only by being our brothers and our sisters keepers and our own keepers that victory is possible. Wonderful message that you're leaving us there with um, Denver. Thank you so much for also sharing us uh, with us your world. Um, we are slightly uh, running out of time, but I think I want to wrap up our dialogue this morning um, and just uh, a question uh, to, to our panelists. Um, Dr. Kimberg has mentioned something very, very important in his presentation, um, and that is uh, the issue around poor sex education at school, which I believe is, is, a, is a real issue. Um, and it brings me to, to the question, because this is um, a year uh, later, last year we had um, the first uh, conference. And in terms of, of, of um, media uh, support groups and, and education, where are we in specifically those three areas a year later after the first conference? And our panelists um, are welcome to, to address that. Um, Helena, I think you just need to unmute. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so in my mind, I think that conversation is a conversation that, is, that has a number of other aspects that goes along with it. So currently I'm aware that there is quite a huge drive to educate uh, young girls, particularly on the issues, on menstrual issues, to educate young people around the issues of menstrual issues. Um, and I'm quite, and I'm sure that in that space, um, the issues of um, hygiene, um, just general hygiene when it comes to, to sexual reproductive health is also being addressed. Are we doing enough in terms of sharing um, from a fertility perspective, how, how that, uh, is there a big enough portion 
covered from a fertility perspective? Probably not. I'm sure that there is a lot more that can be done. I know that um, even the book that, that was launched last year does touch on the issues, particularly on the issues of, of, of stigma, um, the book of Polis that Dr. Veronica made mention of earlier. But I think um, this is really why these kind of conversations on these types of platforms are really important. This is not something that has yet been incorporated into our educational curriculums and things like that. But it is certainly something that we should all be taking note of. Educators, whether you're an educator um, at a high school, whether you're a mother, you're, you're a father, you're just randomly scrolling by and you happen to find this conversation ongoing. I think it's a conversation that we can all promote in the different spheres that we are. And it's a conversation that we can include, particularly on those discussions that we know include uh, young people. So I think that the short answer to your question is probably not a very structured, focused um, approach to it, towards it, but I strongly want to believe that it is something that is currently being addressed in some way through the education that is done around menstru menstruation, the education that is done around sexual health, the, um, the, the education that is done around just hygiene, general uh, um, sexual hygiene. Thank you. Thank you, Helena. Dr. Malunga, anything from your um, side? Rishi? Um, just to, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Yes, just to say, Rishi, um, everything is a stepping stone. Uh, sorry, can we hear me? Um, can hear everything you. is a. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. I think it might be the connection on um, Dr. Malunga's side. I think we might have a bit of a connection. Okay, there we go. Doctor, are you back with us? Unmute. <laughs> You just need to unmute. Sorry. There we go. Yes, sorry. Um, yes. Connection, connection issues. Um, just to say, Roche, uh, it's, it, everything takes small steps. Um, it's us having this conference. This is a second year into our conference. Uh, slowly and slowly, we're getting there. We're starting the conversations. The conversations have started. Um, it's now for our hope is to take it forward. Um, there is still a lot of growth that we have to do, but it requires each and every one of us to come on board. Just like uh, Helena said, irregardless of how small it is, it starts with us having the conversations. It starts with us changing the narratives. And um, we have listened what the conference has brought out. We're still limited in terms of providing fully fertility treatments in the public setting. Most of it is done in the private sector, which is a bit expensive. Not everybody has access to it. So there's a number of challenges that we are facing. It's getting government to set up policies with regards to uh, treating infertility like any other condition in the, um, in the medical fertility. So there's really a lot of things that uh, still has to be done. But slowly and surely we're getting there because the good thing is we have started. And from now on, it's just moving forward and not looking back. So I would want to say to each and everyone, especially with all the participants in, 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 um, who've tuned in, that it starts small. I think the most take home message here for all each and every one of us, it's starting small. Regardless, it's having those conversations at home. It's having those conversations with our friends. It's, it's, it's being empathetic. It's being understanding because infertility is a very sensitive issue. It's a very sensitive topic. Um, and it's not just thing that we can just bring it out there. You know, it's people's privacy. So it, we really have to also tread very carefully, but it's being aware that infertility is, um, is, uh, is there it's out there. It's dealing with the stigma that, uh, uh, that arises because the biggest thing is the stigma. Um, so once we have to be able to tackle the stigma around infertility, we will actually be able to now move forward and bring the issues that we really want to 
address. So for, the, for everybody, let's start small, let's have the conversations, let's be understanding, let's not just look at it as it's a woman's issue, that it's only women that causes infertility. There are various reasons of what infertility causes by. It's educating ourselves on the, an infertility. It's actually also asking the question at the end of the day, what can I do? How can I contribute to this topic? How can I, uh, how, what is the solution that I can bring in? And I'm seeing from, from, from from uh, the comments that there's a lot of the questions asking what can we do so that really is humbling and it shows that people are interested people want to get involved so it's just mm -hmm. for us to actually set the platforms so that people can come on board and people can join us because this struggle is each and every one of us it requires all of us to bring in all our um, our input so that's what i actually want to bring out with this um, from this conference that it starts with each one of us absolutely yeah so, so starting with each one of us, um, and, and Denver, you're welcome to chip in here as well. What are some of the immediate um, low-hanging fruits that we can capitalize on? And, and what would you recommend as possible solutions? Um, yeah, and what's the way forward um, and understand that we as Namibians should be taking uh, collectively? Rache? Denver, please go ahead. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll jump right onto it. I know we press for time very seriously. Um, I think collaboration is absolutely crucial. One of the participants suggested that there needs to be collaboration between um, the One Economy Foundation slash Merck Foundation and perhaps the national broadcaster because not everyone has access to the internet. Not everyone would have then have been able to, to sign up and register for this virtual conference to make sure that we make this accessible we do know that there is a technological divide that impacts um, access uh, very seriously. So we could also transcribe this and make it available to radio stations. Those spots that are pertinent, those spots that speak to a specific audience for a specific situation or purpose in that moment. So I think access needs to be unrestricted as far and wide as possible. That would be my proposal as far as a low hanging fruit is concerned. Thank you, Denver. Dr. Malunga or Helena, what um, would you I, call out as some of those low hanging fruits and possible yeah. solutions? I think Denver led us right into it and it was, the, it was really the right place to start. Collaboration is really key. Um, all these things, to be honest, are, they cost money. So there are financial partners that need to assist um, in the development of the different channels and platforms and material. And, and making that making it possible to have tangible things to drive through on 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 school levels if you want to, but also in the communities. Um, when you think about community leaders, when you think about um, traditional leaders, when you think about church leaders, these are all platforms where we can make a difference if we channel the conversation correctly. Absolutely. I think we've got a bit of a connection challenge there with Helena. Perhaps we can, Helena, you're back. Yeah. I think I'll give Dr. Malunga um, <laughs> the opportunity maybe just to conclude on that question. Um, yes, I would also, well, we in would terms want of the to, way forward. Um, also Yes, it's uh, lobbying for government to get involved, to really have uh, set up a system where each and everyone um, can access uh, the fertility uh, treatment. So I think it's lobbying for policies, it's bringing policies in place. And um, like Elena has also touched a bit on it, the surrogacy issue, the adoption issue, um, bringing those laws into um into place, starting those policies, because at times uh, people want to adopt, people want to surrogate, but they don't know the way forward because there's no laws in place, there's no policies in place. So I think it's also putting pressure on government to have uh, these policies in place so that we can able to effectively fight this solution from all angles, from, from all aspects. Dr. Malunga, thank you so much for your contribution. Um, Denver, we'd like to thank you so much. 
I think uh, judging by the comments um, in the chat box, as you've rightly mentioned, um, there is really a huge interest in this topic, but the interest is also to find solutions and to really come on board um, to own this collectively. And I think that is absolutely commendable. Um, Helena, uh, we'd like to thank you also for having taken the time out um, to join this dialogue. Unfortunately, Dr. Lugano and Dorby had to leave us as he's traveling. He's asked to be excused. But to our panelists, thank you so much for an insightful conversation today. And um, yes, together we can. Dr. Esperance, over to you. Thank you very much for that insightful interactive dialogue, Roche. I definitely learned a lot, I must say, quite a lot of wisdom coming there from every single one of our panelists. Thank you very much for that. Now, just quickly to touch on a few of the questions, I noted two particular questions that I wanted to touch on just before we wrap up. One of the questions says, where can one go for testing to know if you cannot give birth? Now, just a very, very quick way to address this question is you literally go anywhere. So what you would like to do at this point is you'd like to see your doctor. So wherever it is you're based, or Shakati, Ungwediva, Vintuk, Swakopmund, Valvis Bay, if it is a qualified medical doctor, they should be able to start you on the baseline investigation. So what we normally do is when we get a patient, first thing is to obviously take a full detailed history. It'll involve quite a lot of asking a lot of detailed questions, your age, your husband or your partner's age, whether you smoke, whether you drink, stress factors, whether you have previous children or not, whether it's the first time you're trying to get pregnant, and then also your menstrual history. So it's quite a detailed history that will be taken and then you or doctor being a qualified medical practitioner will then be able to direct and say, all right, this is most likely what might be the cause. It's a factor. Let's go ahead and do maybe an abdominal sonar, or let's start off with our baseline bloods first. Let's check your, your, your hormone levels, and then they will take it from there. So generally speaking, any medical practitioner that is qualified will be able to start you on the baseline and then refer you to the relevant specialist. And then the last question that I'll tackle says, are there any doctors in the coast, they said in Swakop, that deal with recurrent miscarriages? Now, very similar to the, the first question I answered, generally, all your medical practitioners should be able to start you off on a baseline. So there are various causes for recurrent miscarriage. It might be anatomical causes. So whatever it is, all right, if it's anatomical causes, most likely it's structural abnormalities, maybe problems with your uterus shape, maybe problems with the vagina, whatever the case may be, once again, your medical practitioner should be able to start you off on a baseline and then refer you to the relevant parties. So recurrent miscarriage, generally speaking, any medical practitioner should be able to start you off and then refer you if they are not able to then solve it further. Now, without wasting any more time, we have unfortunately, very sadly, come to the end of our conference. And just to end off from my side before I head, hand over to Mr. Bernardus, is to say that infertility very much falls under quality healthcare. And with quality healthcare, it is important to always remember that at the center of it lies patient education. And so conferences like this is a very first step in ensuring that we educate people from all corners of the world and ensuring that we increase their baseline general knowledge of health in order to improve their health seeking behaviors. So to wrap off, I'd like to welcome Head of Programs at the One Economy Foundation, Mr. Bernardus Harrigan. Thank you, Dr. Levendal, uh, for that uh, excellent summary. And my job is very simple today, is just to say thank you to everybody, all the panelists who have participated and especially the participants who have joined us from across the country, as far as the Kavangos, Sambezi, Harda, Komas, Irongo, um, who have been actively engaging on the Zoom platform as well as our participants on Facebook, who have been fantastic. Um, we're really bringing significant contributions and recommendations for our consideration. I think a couple of things that I just wanna reiterate as we close off is I think education is a key thing. A lot of the questions that were coming to the fore was, where do I access services? Where do I find the help? What is available? Where can I get financing, et cetera? So I think what we need to definitely think about is expanding the conversation around education and information sharing. And then the second one is really the celebration of the personal narrative of 
every person that has kind of shared their own journey, which is a very personal struggle um, that you had the bravery to be able to share on this platform and be able to encourage others. And I think that speaks to the fact that having frank, honest, difficult conversations is informed by our be free engagements, is that it allows others to finally feel like I'm not alone. I'm not the only one dealing with the struggle. And there are others who I can lean on, I can engage with, I can learn from. And I think that is important. And I wanna just applaud and commend all the uh, persons that have shared their testimonies, uh, both the men and the women, um, and those even in the chat boxes and in the Q&A sessions that have shared their own journeys and said, thank you for bringing it to the fore. So I wanna encourage all of us to continue to reach out and continue to seek for that support and so forth. And you're welcome to reach out, of course, to our office, um, or we'll share the stuff on our social media where you can reach us on our email or via our social media pages if you need further support or referral to a support group, etc. And then the last thing that I also wanted to raise was around the conversation on cost and financing. And I think that's advocacy role that um, the First Lady continues to play and other First Ladies across the continent um, as raised by the Merck uh, Foundation continue to play to really see how do you make sure that our universal healthcare is able to respond to the needs of people on the ground on a day-to-day basis. So when you think about the costing, how do you reduce costs? How do you make sure that people are able to access, co uh, access services, medical services? That continues to be a, a prevalent issue because if the care cost is a barrier, then that removes that person from accessing and benefiting and enjoying those services. So I think what is very critical for us as we're moving forward now, and even uh, is really that education and campaigning to really bring that to the fore, uh, for us to consolidate where the services are, and for us to really think about who are the different players that we can engage. And I love the fact that our panel has people from the media fraternity, medical experts, uh, human rights advocates. Um, so it really allows us to be able to pull in and leverage each person's strengths and, uh, um, and work that they're doing. So I just want to encourage all of us. Um, Budget that is sitting in and I just want to tell all of us to continue to tune in and keep a lookout on our social media pages as we share further information. Please do reach out to us. Um, I know some of the some of the participants have reached out to some of the panelists personally. Um, but if there's any information that you need, please uh, keep get us in, uh, engaged, and we'll be more than happy to. If we cannot assist you, be able to refer you to uh, somebody who will be able to provide the support. But once again, thank you, Dr. Levendal. Thank you, Roche. Thank you, Denver. Uh, thank you to the Merck Foundation, to our participants. Have a fantastic, fantastic weekend ahead, um, and I look forward to, for us to further engage. Have a good day.